Live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu, kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. on this Wednesday afternoon. And we start with a look back at the last Fed meeting, that two-day Fed meeting ending on December 13th. No decision on rates, but a big decision on that dot plot. Kaylee Lines is down in Washington right now with a readout of the FOMC minutes. Kaylee. Well, Romaine, Chairman Powell already said at the press conference last month that rate cuts were discussed at this meeting, but the minutes show those cuts are not eminent. The participants did view the policy rate as likely at or near its peak for this tightening cycle, and almost all participants indicated that their baseline suggestion projections imply a lower target range for Fed funds would be appropriate by the end of 2024. However, the minutes also say that, quote, participants noted it was possible that the economy would evolve in a manner that would make further increases in the target range appropriate. Going on to say that participants also, quote, reaffirmed it would be appropriate for policy to remain at a restrictive stance for some time until inflation was clearly moving down sustainably to the Fed's 2% target. Now, on the subject of inflation, the minutes do say all participants observed clear progress had been made in 2023 towards that 2 percent objective, though they would need to see more evidence that inflation pressures were abating sustainably. And they did note upside risk to inflation, although the minutes say those have diminished. Participants also generally perceived a, quote, high degree of uncertainty surrounding the economic outlook. As for the employment outlook, the FOMC assessed the labor market continued to come in to better balance, though several participants noted the risk that if labor demand were to weaken substantially further, it could transition quickly from a gradual easing to a more abrupt downshift in conditions. And a final note on financial conditions. The minutes do note the observation that there had been an easing in financial conditions since the summer and say that many participate, participants remarked an easing in financial conditions beyond what is appropriate could make it difficult for the committee to reach its inflation goal. Kaylee Lyons down in Washington here with the readout of the minutes from the most recent FOMC meeting. Of course, the next meeting coming at the end of this month. But we start off here on this January 3rd now with a closer look here at what we learned out of the Fed over the last few weeks and what kind of read we have going forward on the state of the economy. Ed Yardeni joining us right now. Yardeni Research President to help kick us off uh, to the closing bell. And I do want to start off here, Ed, with some of the uh, commentary that we heard from Powell uh, back in mid-December. Some of the readout that we got today out of those FOMC minutes, this seems to be a ratification of the market's desire to have seen that peak in rates, but not so much a ratification of the market's desire to see those rates come down fast anytime soon. I think that's absolutely uh, on target. I think that the Fed uh, has, has achieved its uh, restrictive stance, and I don't think there are any rush to uh, move to, to ease. I mean, the economy's been doing fine. The unemployment rate is still below 4%. Inflation is coming down, but it's not at 2% yet. So I think uh, you just got to take them at their word. I think they're going to be very data dependent, as they always are. And if the economy continues to do well, especially with the drop in long-term rates, mortgage rates have come down, that should give us some boost to housing activity and housing-related retail sales. So it looks to me as though there's no recession in sight. The economy is doing fine. Inflation is coming down. What's the rush to lower interest rates if the economy is demonstrating it can live with these kind of levels? And that seems to be the message from the Fed right now. Right. How does that square with what the market has priced in right now? Well, I, I think, as you mentioned, the market is priced in more than that. They priced in I mean, the federal funds rate futures for 12 months from now indicates five rate cuts of 25 basis point each. I'm in the camp that agrees with what you know, just following the lead of the Fed, and they're saying they're going to cut it three times, and now they're saying, you know, don't expect it to be in the first half of the year. It's not going to be early in the year. So I think maybe if we're going to get rate cuts, they'll occur in the second half of the year, uh, which is, uh, you know, mosing along at a slower pace than the market has uh, discounted. So I think the market may be in for a little bit of stall here. Mm. I don't know if it's a real sell-off, but it could really stall out for a while. 
All right, and of course we are looking at a bit of a stall out when you looks when you look at the price action today and yeah. yesterday as well. Last year, Ed, uh, the consensus coming into the new year was that recession was just around the corner, and that led to yeah. trepidation. Everyone's convinced this year that recession can be avoided, which kind of yeah. lays the groundwork for complacency. Talk about how investor mindset contributes to positioning that can therefore lead to unexpected price action. Well, clearly, if uh, now that uh, the 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 recession scare has gone away and there's fewer people worrying about that. What we're seeing is maybe too much bullishness, too much optimism. Uh, we're seeing some of these surveys of sentiment uh, approaching levels that in the past suggested that everybody's bought in and uh, all it takes is some bad news to have them start to would take some profits. I mean, we still have some uh, issues. Inflation isn't all the way down to 2%. Uh, we have to watch the price of oil. So far, it's been very accommodating of a bullish stance because despite all the craziness in the Middle East, the price of oil has actually been coming down. If things get a lot crazier in the Middle East to the point where it affects the price of oil going up, uh, people will so suddenly be uh, thinking all about 1970s all over again as a possibility. You know, that was our, that scare for the past couple of years that uh, we would have a, a repeat of the 1970s with two energy shocks. So yeah. we get another energy shock that could be a problem. But uh, overall, I think, um, you know, the, the, the market's uh, priced for uh, maybe perfection for a little while here. And the world is imperfect, as we as we know from the from our experience. Well, let's talk a little bit more about some of those imperfections, because if you have a case here for uh, economic doldrums, maybe even an economic recession here, I think most people agree that some of that might be the result of I guess, for lack of a better phrase, a black swan event or a gray swan type of event, yeah. rather than something that's a little bit more uh, organic mm -hmm. in nature. I mean, the obvious ones obviously are surrounding geopolitics, whatever's going on right, right now in the Red Sea and Israel and Iran, and, and God knows what's going to happen with the U.S. election here this year. What's most important to you to, to keep an eye on? Well, I think you're, you're spot on. I think the geopolitics is the, is the issue here. Uh, we saw the beginning of this uh, war with the Hamas attacking Israel on October 7th. And so far, it's stayed relatively uh, contained to that part of the war, uh, that uh, co confrontation. But meanwhile, there's always the risk that uh, uh, Israel and Hezbollah will uh, s start um, more ag aggressive uh, war situation. And then uh, we've got the Houthis uh, being backed by the, the Iranians disrupting a Red Sea uh, passage. And it's, uh, it's all d disconcerting. And as I said, so far, because uh, China's in a recession, Europe's in a recession, oil prices have, yeah. have been coming down. But if you disrupt the price of, of oil, yeah. we get another spike that could uh, suddenly bring back an inflation and recession scare. I'm curious, I mean, uh, and this, forgive me if this is a dumb question, but when you go back through history and past uh, cycles mm -hmm. of disruption and geopolitical uh, uncertainty here, right. is are the correlations that we have in the world today, meaning that sort of globalized nature of our economies and the intertwined nature of those economies, is that yeah. still as strong as what it used to be? Well, I think in some ways it's, it still is. I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, deglobalization uh, but uh, what uh, we're seeing right now is that uh, even though clearly there's been uh, a move by some companies to move out of China, we still do a lot of business with China. And China's having a recession related to their the bursting of their property bubble, uh, which is why inflation's coming down here. Uh, the, the widespread perception was that we couldn't possibly get inflation down here w without a recession here. Well, it turned out there was a recession in China that brought goods prices down dramatically. And now all we have to do is get rent inflation down. So globalization is actually still there. We, we still are seeing the impact of what's going on over there impacting us over here. All right, Ed, always uh, great uh, to talk to you. Uh, we'll catch up Thank with you, you again soon, I'm sure. Ed Yardeni sure. over at Yardeni Research here. We should point out stocks pretty much now are holding on to the levels that they were at right before those Fed minutes levels, we should point out that are in the red. We're going to get more reaction in just a bit on the latest Fed Minutes and the impact on markets. Nadia Lovell, senior U.S. equity strategist at UBS Global Wealth Management, is on deck. Plus, a new twist in the battle for control of Disney's board. CEO Bob Iger winning more support as he tries to resist pressure from activist Nelson Peltz. We've got the latest. And a discussion with the Rune Sundararaja on the professor of entrepreneurship over at NYU and his insights on that legal battle between media companies like the New York Times and OpenAI that wants to scrape all of their hard-earned reporting. That conversation coming up in a bit, right here on The Close on Bloomberg.
The jobs report last month beat estimates. That is a stunning number. That is what nobody was expecting. The bullish train has left the station. This is what Powell does not want to see. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. You're really not seeing the level of restrictiveness show up yet in the labor market. Significant job growth and high labor force participation. There's a very strong chance that the market is mispriced for 2024. The December Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. First half of the year, I suspect nothing. Back half of the year, they could easily move a couple. They could move a couple of times. We started this journey with inflation at 10 percent, rates at zero, unemployment at three and a half percent, and my objective was to get us to four, four, and four. Four percent inflation, four percent rates, four percent unemployment. We're about three percent inflation. We're five percent, five and a half in rates, and we're about three and a half in unemployment. So rates will come down. And that was part of an exclusive conversation we had with James Gorman over at Morgan Stanley a little bit earlier right here on Bloomberg Television. And of course, those comments came just before we got the minutes out of the latest Fed meeting, which actually showed us exactly what the Fed's thinking is on that 444. Frank, frankly, they're thinking a little bit lower than that. Nadia Lovell joining us right now, UBS senior U.S. equity strategist. And Nadia, let's talk about rate expectations, because I'm sure, as you've noticed, this was a market that towards the end of last year really got ahead of the Fed, making it clear that they think the Fed is going to cut, and at least based on Bloomberg pricing, going to cut six times this year before we get to uh, the end of the year. I am curious as to whether you think that is too aggressive. We do. We think that's too aggressive. I mean, we think that it's likely to be more three to four cuts this year um, because we aren't calling for a recession. We think that the market pricing would suggest that there could be a recession if the Fed is going to move so aggressively. I mean, we heard from Birkin this morning the continued upside risk to inflation. And just a couple of weeks ago from Bostic pointed out that rate cuts might not happen until the third quarter if inflation you know, continues to decline as forecast. Yes. Yes, we all know that the inflation is coming down faster than what the Fed has forecast. I mean, for PCE on a six month annualized basis is now under two percent. Um, but the point is that there is still caution from some members of the committee. And so we don't think that the market that's pricing in a March cut is likely. It's probably more around May. We also have financial conditions that have yeah. eased a lot in the last couple of months. You know, and we also have now, you know, GDP now from Atlanta Fed is at two and a half percent. So yeah. what is the rush for the Fed to cut? Well, that gets us to the broader question then, too, about market positioning. I mean, we saw towards the end of last year, the outperformance performance, finally, of cyclical stocks, as at least as measured by the Russell 2000, even the S&P 400 mid caps as well. And while the first two days haven't seen that same outperformance, there does seem to be much more of an appetite over the last couple of months to buy some of those names and gravitate away from just the big cap tech names. Yes, I mean, we do think that you will see more of a normal year. And to us, a normal year is more of a broadening out of a price performance in the market. And so that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that some of the winners from last year can't continue to outperform. Uh, we think that they can, but you'll be more selective and the performance gap will narrow. But so we think that from a portfolio standpoint, what you want to do is maintain some exposures to some of those secular winners that are in areas like tech, but at the same time, complement that with some of the cyclical laggers from last year, including areas like small cap that does, despite the fact that you've seen a bit of recovery, they still, still think that there's more to go. Even within the big cap index, uh, there have been some stocks that have been ignored, uh, namely 493 of them within the S&P 500. Um, since uh, rates peaked on October 23rd, the equal weight S&P 500 has outperformed the Magnificent Seven by uh, almost five percentage points. How far along that rotation do you think we are? Are we one-fourth of the way through, one-third of the way through? I think that we're probably closer to, you know, um, a third of the way through that rotation. Like, again, I, I, we don't think that the um, some of the winners from last year are going to necessarily underperform this year. But we do think that you do want to broaden out your exposure. You are right. Um, 
the fact is that you do have 493 other companies within the marketplace that can benefit this year, particularly if you do have economic growth holding intact for this year, which we think that it will. And you do have companies that are able to to deliver on that earnings growth. And Mm. so having some exposure to some of the areas, yes, some of the cyclical areas, yes, we're neutral on financials, but there could be some opportunities there as well, as well as in industrials and even also in energy that has lagged recently as well. Right. And you mentioned industrials, you mentioned energy, you mentioned financials. When it comes to the earnings outlook, and we know the big cap stocks begin reporting earnings on January 12th, what sector could be uh, providing the biggest source of upside surprise? You know, I think financials, you could, which will, banks will kick off next week, could be a source of upside surprise. I mean, one of the things is that financials had really started provision for a worsened economic environment. As I noted, GDP for the fourth quarter seems to be coming in above expectations, and that would mark the sixth consecutive quarter of a growth trend growth. And so the the uh, forecast that a lot of the banks has put forward, uh, it seems that the economy is coming in better from that. So that could be a source of upside. And you're starting to see some free issues in capital markets activity as well. Um, I think also in terms of industrials, you're seeing even this morning in terms of ISM manufacturing has been in a slump for quite some time, but it does feel like it's bottoming up and you're starting to see some pickup in that inventories that'll be coming clean. And so areas of industrials might be a source of um, upside surprise as well this coming earnings season. And this gets back though to the, some of the defensive sectors that people are gravitating to. I'm talking about within the equity space, particularly healthcare and some of those other areas here. Does that, do, do gains in those other areas come at the expense of those defensive uh, names? Uh, with these defensive, we prefer consumer uh, staples. Um, we're still a bit cautious on like areas like utilities. But I think healthcare, uh, which traditionally is a defensive sector, we are neutral on the sector, but we do have a major conference in the industry, the JP Morgan conference next week, that tends to be a catalyst for the space where we'll get a lot of updates from various um, you know, healthcare companies across the board. The innovation is still happening in the space within healthcare, though, although we're neutral. We do like exposure to some of the GLP-1 and weight loss drug names uh, within that space that we think that will have tremendous upside uh, this year. So that's that's how we sort of position within healthcare, even though, uh, as, as in terms of uh, defensive exposure. All right, Nadia, really appreciate your joining us and Happy New Year to you. Nadia Lavelle of UBS there. And I'm glad uh, Nadia brought up GLP-1 because when it comes to healthcare, yes, we think of it traditionally as a defensive sector, but because of those weight loss drugs, they become kind of a growth uh, segment on their own. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yesterday we were watching TV at at home with the family, and I think every commercial break (laughs) was Munjaro, Ozempic, and repeat, Munjaro, Ozempic, Munjaro, Ozempic. Just in case you didn't get it, right? I don't know, I guess. I feel like like we should all just be on it right now. Well, they would love that if that happened. If everyone's skinny, is anyone really skinny? Well, you have to stay on it, and the minute you get off of it, then you won't be skinny anymore. Oh, interesting. That's a nice business model. (laughs) All right, coming up, we're going to have the latest in the battle over control of Disney's board. CEO Bob Iger is lining up some new support. That's next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back uh, to the close here. Keeping an eye on markets right now around session lows here for the major equity indices. Of course, coming off what yesterday was one of the worst starts uh, to a new year for equities in more than a couple of decades here. That's extending in for a second day. Meanwhile, Scarlett, there are a few bright spots out there. And one that I'm actually taking a look at is Disney. The shares are up about a percent here on the day. And there's a lot swirling around this company. More importantly, a lot swirling around Bob Iger. At least for now, investors seem... I guess to think this is going to be a good thing. I guess they're encouraged yeah. that he is trying to do his best to fend off uh, pushes by Nelson Peltz, the activist investor, to take control of the board. Um, Bob Iger has lined up some allies on his side. How it shakes out remains to be seen. And so joining us now is Bloomberg's Thomas Buckley in Los Angeles to give us a little bit more context here. So, Thomas, uh, we know that Bob Iger has lined up two hedge fund activist firms, uh, Value Act and Blackwell's. Tell us a little bit about what Value Act is perfor- uh, providing here to Iger as he tries to push back and fend off Nelson Peltz's um, moves to take control of the board. Absolutely. Well, great to be with you. I mean, I think it's interesting. If you roll back, you know, the 
the boat all the way back to this time last year. Um, Nelson Peltz had a very fierce activist campaign underway at, at Disney and then backed away after he felt as though Iger was delivering on a number of points that he's advocated for. Now, that is better return on invested capital, a series of cost-cutting measures, including um, about 8,000 job reductions, and the resumption of dividend payments. I think that Nelson still feels as though there's a lot of room um, for improvement at Disney, not least of which as concerns issues relating to governance, succession planning, and what we're seeing now is another activist value act that's held a stake for some time agree to a information sharing protocol with Disney that might actually help Iger ins become insulated um, against a number of Nelson's demands. You have an increasingly contentious yeah. and, and crowded battle for board seats here. Well, I, I am curious about this. I mean, I understand from a personal perspective why Iger would want to circle the wagons. I certainly understand why he would want to take shots at belts. There are a lot of other investors out there that are unhappy. They may not necessarily have the name recognition and the clout as Nelson Peltz. But most of those people, assuming they bought this stock over the last couple of years, particularly since Iger showed up, are in the red right now. Does Iger have a response to that? Absolutely. I mean, that's a very important point to make. I think that, you know, had you bought these shares two years ago, back when the stock was trading, you know, in some days above $200 a share, now down to about 90 it's, it's a very... Uh, sorry, I think we lost our connection there with uh, Thomas Buckley, our entertainment reporter out there in Los Angeles, Scarlett. And of course, I mean, this does get to the whole issue as to sort of what's really being litigated here, right? Mm -hmm. I understand no, Peltz has made clear, or at least tried to make clear in the public what he wanted. Iger doesn't seem to think he made it clear to him. But by putting Value Act around you and Blackwell's, I mean, that's great if they see eye to eye, but it doesn't really address the issue is that sales are slowed, profitability has waned, and the stock price since Iger's return has not actually returned much of anything. But it does buy him time. And to what, do what? He, what he needs right now is time to get this reorganization underway. He's cut costs and he's streamlining everything. He's talked about selling off assets. Yeah. Whether that's actually going to happen is a completely different story. Uh, remember, everything was kind of up for grabs. I, I don't think those were exact words, but he was looking at different offers. Yeah. Um, and he hasn't actually made a move, but this idea that he's looking to see if there's any kind of price discovery for the assets that Disney could potentially sell. I mean, look, I get it. I mean, he wants the space to do whatever, you know, mm -hmm. to, to execute his vision here. But it gets to the point, too, at, at some point, is everyone really on board with this vision? Or is just him so committed to this is what we're going to do, I'm going to put people, uh, put, trying to get people on the board around me who agree with that? Or is he still open to maybe some of the other criticisms out there, including Peltz's? I, I don't know exactly all of Peltz's I mean, individual criticisms, but is, is that going to be addressed as well? That's a good point. And Nelson Peltz's uh, issue of succession planning, that's a big one. And it's been something that, it's been Did they Iger's have a Achilles heel. That's the issue. I mean, they they he had really. one. It didn't, it didn't quite work, work out. out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, there are lots of succession yeah. opportunities that didn't pan out for Iger. The bigger issue, though, is strategy in terms but of well, how you move pan forward. out. But he was the man leading that, that, that success. I, I, I just don't want to let him off the hook because I feel like a lot of what he's fixing now is a legacy from when he was there. Not necessarily just when Chapek was there. Chapek, his own mistakes? Chapek made, certainly made some mistakes, but there were a lot of mistakes that Chapek inherited from his predecessor, yeah. now his successor. And I don't know who succeeds Iger, but is this just going to be a repeat of it? Well, that's what Nelson uh, wants to find out. All right. It's like a riddle wrapped inside, what is it? An, An enigma, enigma uh, mystery. A bubble gum wrapper. All right. Stick with us. We'll be back in a moment. From New York, this is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 2.30 here in New York. Keep an eye on what's going on in the equity markets. A bit of a repeat of what we saw yesterday here with stocks moving lower, but a bit of a flip-flop that we're seeing in the commodity space with oil moving higher. Abigail Doolittle, she's standing by right now with our commodities close. Abigail. Indeed, we have some wider mixed moves here for the commodities that we're taking a look at. Uh, overall for the commodity index, a more muted move. But you can see New York crude, a nice bounce here, up 3.3%. Continued increased tensions uh, in the Middle East. There's now supply disruptions uh, in Libya. Plus, OPEC, an OPEC statement uh, stressing their commitment to stabilizing prices, uh, seems to be pushing some traders back into crude oil, which is interesting because the Bloomberg dollar index is higher for a fourth day. Typically, that would push commodities in general lower. Natural gas up 4 percent. European natural gas is up sharply on uh, freezing weather. A sympathy trade here at one point, natural gas had been heading to its best day uh, in many, quite some time, uh, a long time ago. And then gold and 
and silver, you can see these metals, really very sensitive to that stronger dollar, gold down 1.2%, also maybe a bit of a recalculation of some Fed bets after those FOMC minutes came out. Silver at the lows, Romaine, had been down more than 3% at that point, heading to its worst day since October 2nd, but off those lows, still down. Uh, interesting reversal coming off some of the strength that we saw towards the end of last year. Let's dive a little bit deeper into what to expect in 2024. Natasha Kaneva, jo Kaneva joining us right now, head of global commodity strategy over at JP Morgan to talk a little bit here about the prospects for 2024. Great to have you here in the studio. Thank you for having me. Abigail ended on silver and gold, so let's start there. I mean, gold had a phenomenal year. I think it was something like 13% gain. First game we've seen in about three years and, of course, had that record high in December. Is there anything left? Uh, yes, we believe actually there is more left. Uh, so um, we believe that the word for commodities markets in 2024, it's tactical. One has to be tactical similarly as in 2023 to, gen to generate returns in the commodities markets. But the only one structural bullish recommendation we have and we maintain is in gold. So in November 2022, we issued a buy recommendation for gold, as you absolutely correctly pointed out in early December. We reached the record levels. We mm -hmm. believe there is more to come. Uh, in essence, we believe that the Fed cutting cycle in the second half of 2024, the first half of 2025, will generate uh, another boost in returns. And the target we have for the year, for the end of this year, is $2,300 mm -hmm. for gold. I just saw that we're trading at 2050 so it's a significant boost up from the current levels. Yeah. In the case of silver, it's $30 yeah. target. All right. Well, I understand the correlations there, of course, with what's going on with rates. Let's talk about a commodity that I think is probably a little bit harder to predict right now, and that's oil. Uh, obviously, there's been huge fluctuations, primarily because of geopolitics. And as of late, there's been a lot of supply, demand, and balances. Where do you see us going this year? So in the case of oil, we believe that 2024 will be very similar to what happened in 2023. So the narrative behind our view since November 2022 has been that there will be no issue with demand. Demand is absolutely great. We had tons of pent-up demand. Yes, it's just demand normalizing back to 2019 levels, like you're traveling more than you traveled in 2022 and so on. So at the same time, the global economy has been pretty resilient in 2023, and that's the call for 2024 as well. So demand is absolutely great. But our call in November 2022 was already that non-OPEC supply will be even greater. And just if you look at the numbers, in 2023, global demand grew by 1.8 spectacular number non-opec supply 2.3 million barrels per day in 2024 global demand again extremely healthy 1.6 million barrels per day that's our view non-opec supply will be more than matching that at 1.7 million barrels per day the main issue is actually 2025 when we have demand growing at about 1 million barrels per day why we're done with spent up demand at the same time all those um, decarbonization policies that were put in place more than a decade ago, now they really, really start showing up in the numbers. We see this on an annualized basis in 2025. Non-OPEC supply, however, will be growing at 2 million barrels yeah. per day, twice the rate. And a lot of that would be coming from um, price in elastic deep yeah. water production in Brazil, Guyana, a little bit Norway. Yeah. So um, hence, you know, the target for next year, for, I'm sorry, for this year for us is $83 average. But the call for us is that actually it will be trading in a very wide range, $20 range between $70 and $90. Right. Yes, in December, we so, believe... So 83, so not going up much, but a lot of volatility. In exactly. Yeah. So there will be a lot of tactical opportunities. Yeah. Hence again, the name, you know, tactical, you have yeah. to be tactical. In December, we yeah. believe 74 Brent was way too low. We, we issued the recommendation to, to establish some yeah. links. So right now, we believe that actually by April, we'll be hitting mid 80s. By May and June, high 80s. Yeah. So I want to ask you about the non-OPEC supply, mm -hmm. because you talk about how it's going to ramp up in the years to come. OPEC already, OPEC proper, has had problems with communication and messaging and what they deliver to the world. Um, they had to delay one of their meetings, and when it came out, it was a little bit messy. The market didn't really receive it the way intended. How messy do you expect this, uh, the politics between OPEC and non-OPEC members to get, and what impact will that have on price? Well, so the non-OPEC supply is just price reaction. Yes, if the price is right, the non-OPEC supply will be growing. And the United States is a big part of that. Yes. That. yes. Last year, again, just comparison, 1.8 million barrels per day global demand. U.S. supply alone increased by almost 1.6 million barrels per day. Yes, on top of that, you have Guyana and Brazil. So it, this is just a, it's a reaction to the price, nothing mm -hmm. more than that. So hence, uh, in, in OPEC's situation in 2024, they have to be reactionary. Yes, if they want to balance the market, they have to, to keep the supply constrained. The, the main issue for OPEC would be 2025. 2024, in our view, it's a healthy market. Demand is very healthy. Actually, our 
Uh, our belief is that OPEC should use this opportunity to bring some of the supply back. Will they? Um, so that's what we, uh, that's what our recommendation is, that it makes sense because the main issue for them would be 2025. All right, so watch 2025 when it comes to supply of oil by non-OPEC countries like the United States. Thank you so much. Natasha Kanova of JP Morgan, really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, coming up on The Close, D.A. Davidson says shares of Amazon could get a boost from artificial intelligence this year. We're going to get into the details with the analyst behind that call, Gil Luria, next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start off with WW International. Barclays analyst Stephanie Davis taking over coverage and starting off with an underweight recommendation and an $8 price target. Davis says WW is still in the early innings of digitizing its business, which could actually present some downside risk here in 2024. The shares to the downside today by about 9%. Next up, Verizon, KeyBank, upgrading to overweight, saying 2024 is going to look stable for the wireless communications market. Says competition is low and revenue per user is increasing. The analyst now sees a much more favorable outlook for Verizon as well, up about a percent here on the day. And finally, Amazon. DA Davidson's Gil Luria assuming coverage with a buy rating and a 195 price target. He's placing his bets on Amazon Web Services and the company's investment in generative AI, saying the potential reacceleration of growth in AWS could drive upside to the shares here in 2024. The shares down fractionally here on the day, and those are some of our top calls. Let's stick, though, with that last one, Amazon Web Services, and that call by Gil Loria over at DA Davidson. Please to say that he joins us right now, senior software analyst, I should say, over at DA Davidson. And Gil, let's talk a little bit here about the call on Amazon here. Amazon Web Services, we know, has been a huge bright spot for this company. It's also a behemoth, and I do worry about how much more room there is to grow for a company and a, and a division that size? Well, we think there's a lot of room to grow. The, the shift to the cloud, the shift of enterprise computing to the cloud is, is only really in the initial stages. We're probably only a quarter of the way there. Most computing power is still done on premises by companies. So this big shift that Amazon was one of the pioneers of is still going on and could go for years longer. And Amazon Web Services is the leader by far in that category and that isn't really changing. So it's a leader right now, but you have uh, Microsoft, you have Alphabet moving up quickly and Microsoft in particular with its AI offerings, Azure uh, has a faster growth rate. I know it's a fraction of the size of Amazon. What is Amazon doing to make sure that it holds on to the clients it already has rather than seeing them move over? Right, so let's anchor this in numbers, right? AWS trailing 12 months, about an $87 billion business. Azure, which is the number two hyperscaler, 57 billion, but growing a lot faster. AWS just grew 12%, Azure just grew 28%. The reason that happened was Microsoft has got to AI early. They understood the value of generative AI back in 2021 before we even saw Chad GPT. And they invested in it, they invested in OpenAI, they invested in moving their business in that direction, which is why 2023 was a fantastic year for Azure in gaining share based on their leadership in generative AI. Now, Amazon was caught a little flat-footed, mm -hmm. but you can bet that that's changed over the last 12 months, that they've done what they needed to do to make sure they can provide the infrastructure for the next set of applications around generative AI. And we're gonna see that this year as their growth bottoms at 12% and possibly even accelerates from there as they also become a place where companies can build generative AI applications, deploy them, train them right. and use them for inferencing uh, in AWS, not just in Azure. And part of the work that Amazon is doing is investing in its own data centers, um, utilizing its own chips, as you point out, uh, which makes it less dependent on NVIDIA. What kind of advantage does that confer on, on, on Amazon? Right, so first of all, it makes it far lower cost for them to be able to expand their generative AI capabilities when they can have 
uh, when they're already getting 20 to 25 percent of their computing power off their own chips, they can scale that quickly. They don't have to depend on NVIDIA right now. They can scale that um, using their own resources. They've made a big investment in Anthropic. That's an open AI alternative. So they have what they need to be able to provide this infrastructure for companies trying to build these tools. And those two are really big advantages that it has over anybody but Microsoft. Gil, always great to talk to you, and I'm sure we're going to talk a lot this year here. A very busy man. Gil Loria over at DA Davidson, his latest call today on Amazon and its Amazon Web Services business. Coming up, we're going to talk a little bit more about AI and training AI could come at a cost. We're going to sit down with this exclusive conversation with NYU professor Arun Sundararajan and talk about what's at stake in the New York Times' lawsuit against Microsoft and open AI. That conversation is next on The Close, right here on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. It's time now for our Wall Street Week daily segment. The host of Wall Street Week, David Weston, joins us as he does every day at this time. And today, a conversation about AI, but with a little bit of a twist here. Where is all that data that goes into these AI models? Where is that coming from? And where does it come from? And who owns that data? Exactly right. As you know, the New York Times has brought a lawsuit Mm. against Microsoft and OpenAI on that very subject. And we have now an expert on it. He is Arun Sundarajan. He is professor at NYU Stern School of Business. Arun, great to have you back with us. Thank you. Delighted to be here as always. So first of all, let's go to the basics. What is the New York Times claiming against OpenAI and Microsoft? Um, It's a familiar claim that has been made by a lot of other publishers. Um, that OpenAI has taken the New York Times data, all of their articles, all of their opinions, and has used them to train their generative AI models without getting permission from the New York Times. So New York Times is claiming copyright infringement. So an ordinary claim in that sense, we're told that OpenAI is a very different sort of creature. Does it fit into typical traditional rubric of copyright? Um, It really does force us to have to extend um, intellectual property law as we know it today, because what's happening with the New York Times data is that it's not as if OpenAI is replicating it and trying to profit off of it. It's being fed into this massive neural network, and this neural network is learning how to write new articles, ostensibly in the style of the New York Times. And so it's generating new works using these existing works. So in many ways, like many other cases that we've seen over 2023, um, it looks like we're in uncharted territory legally in terms of like, you know, sort of whose side the courts are gonna fall on. But this gets to this whole idea of fair use of certain uh, things that are out there in the public sphere and the idea of whether you're taking something and I guess essentially just creating your own product without really doing anything novel or different than what the source did to actually create that data or that article or whatever we're talking about. Yep, I mean, this yeah. came up uh, when Google created Google Books. Right. Um, I think a lot of people said, well, you're just digitizing the books and putting them online. Mm-hmm. And Google's argument was, well, no, this is a transformative use. It's creating a completely new product that is going to add value to the existing book because we're not putting the entire book online. Yeah. So more people might go out and buy the book. Yeah, but as we know in practice, that's not really how it worked. I mean, most of us were able to go uh, look at a book uh, on the on the Google Books uh, um, uh, you know page, and without ever having to pay the publisher or the author or anything else, maybe we only wanted one chapter to pass your course or something, and that was good enough for us. But but you did yeah. buy my book, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to get right after the know, show. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Over here, I think it's a little more complicated than Mm -hmm. that because um, OpenAI is not giving you excerpts of New York Times articles. This is not what the New York Times is worried about. Mm -hmm. What they're worried about is that it creates an AI system that can write with the same style and quality Mm -hmm. as the New York Times, which may be one of the facets that people value in the New York Times and pay their subscription for. Mm -hmm. And so this really takes us into a place where there's a lot of risk in the system. You know, OpenAI and other large language model companies like it, Google, Meta, um, are facing what I think is unprecedented regulatory risk 
because um, you know there are probably going to be hundreds more of these copyright infringement lawsuits over 2024 and 2025, mm -hmm. and their ability to innovate and keep innovating um, depends heavily on being able to continue to do what they've been doing. Mm -hmm. Plus, the data is already in their existing models, and so you know if the remedy is that somehow the data has to be taken out of the models, this actually you know, introduces a tremendous amount of risk to the business model. Mm -hmm. I think the risk from the New York Times point of view is, hey, there's gonna be a system that starts to compete with us. And there's a broader societal risk here as well, which is that we are in an era where AI systems can replicate the individual style of a person. You know, I, someone can create a system that writes like me, um, that speaks like David or speaks like you, Romain. And there are right to publicity laws that protect us against those things, but for a lot of people, they're not gonna be accessible. And so it leads us into this fascinating new area where you're saying, um, what are the boundaries around what a human being owns mm -hmm. about their style or their creative process? You mentioned style three or four times. I'm yeah. curious about that, because back when I knew a little bit about copyright, hmm. you can't copyright a fact. Uh, that, that's not copyrightable. You can ex uh, copyright the expression or surrounding yes. fact. Well, is style more like expression or is it more like the fact? Well, if you look at the current law, and again, <clears throat> you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, but what I know about intellectual property law, I think it's the majority view is that artistic style is not protected. And so if you make a certain kind of music or if you, make, if you write in a particular style, that is not protected by copyright law. What is protected are the specific instances of expression of that style, like you know, specific works that you generate. And this seemed like a reasonable trade-off when the Copyright Act was passed, because nobody imagined that there might be a system that replicates your individual style. I think the lawmakers were thinking instead of, you know, if someone creates the first hip-hop song, you don't want that person to own all of hip-hop. You want other people to be able to innovate. So as an economist, not as a lawyer, as an economist, is this potentially an existential risk in the New York Times? I mean, are we looking at a possible world in which I no longer subscribe to the New York Times online or otherwise because I can get the style out of chat GPT? Well, I think that if that point comes, it's a little bit in the future. I don't see it as an existential threat to the New York Times in the near term. Um, what could happen is that another news organization might start that isn't the New York Times, um, but is able to subscribe to a service that gives them the ability to get articles written in the style of the New York Times. It may be insidious. We may not even know why we're attracted to this new news organization um, or the style of The Economist that I know that you like, David. And, and so, um, you know, the immediate risk is perhaps not great, especially to The New York Times that has built such a powerful brand. But I think that there is a tremendous risk to other news organizations um, that have less market power um, in the near term because yeah. um, the ability of AI to create, like, you know, sort of human like writing yeah. has sort of hit that critical point. I, I am curious, though. I mean, this is, we're kind of really going down the rabbit hole here, but yeah. if this gets to the point, where they take so much of the style and the essence of what the Times does or other big publications, won't those publications at some point probably be hobbled from a business and financial perspective to the point where they're not producing that style, that content anymore, at the detriment of some of these AI models that are still relying on those same organizations to feed into their system? Yeah, that, that's, that's a fascinating point, yeah. Romain, because I think if you look at the long run economic problem, it's what's the optimal mix of human-generated and AI-generated content that we need so that the AI models continue to innovate. Yeah. There's been some really interesting research recently that shows that if you train an AI system on purely AI-generated content, um, it generates pretty mundane content. It doesn't sort of get to the extremes. Yeah. You know, the tales in the statistical sense yeah. are um, suppressed and um, like, you know, it's generating everything from the head of the distribution. Yeah. And so eventually this may be the touchstone that lawmakers end up coming back to 
they accept the reality that there's going to be a whole bunch of AI-generated content in the world, and they rewrite copyright law to come up with the optimal balance between human-generated and AI-generated content. That's interesting. I didn't realize that if you train AI on AI, it doesn't work as well. I, I, I didn't know that. It makes <laughs> sense, but I didn't know it. Arun, thank you so much. It's really great to have you with us. As oh, NYU pleasure. Stern professor, uh, 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 Arun Sundarajan. So uh, the one thing I do worry about as yeah. a lawyer, not an economist, right. is, is this basically just a way to negotiate a deal? Well, that's is what I'm curious about. I'm neither, I'm neither a lawyer or an economist, <laughs> but I do seem like like this is what could actually maybe push these companies together to maybe cooperate and work with each other. You know, New York Times gets some money out of it, AI, open AI or whoever works with them gets the content. And, and there's some license yeah. already. You know, the AP yeah. has a license reportedly. Yeah. So they, yeah. some people have already done that. So you wonder yeah. whether this, sometimes you litigate in order to get a license. Yeah. Tomorrow we're going to hear from Bruin Capital founder and CEO George Pine about the move to pay college athletes. And on Friday, we'll talk to former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers about the jobs numbers and the upcoming presidential election. That will be at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Friday. And, of course, David Weston joins us every day right around this time for our Wall Street Week daily segment as we round off into the final hour of trading here on The Close. Stick with us. We'll be back in a moment after the break to break down all of the price action today. This is Bloomberg. about 3 p.m. in New York. This is the countdown to the close. Let's get a view from the top. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. And Romaine, we got Fed minutes. I don't know if it changed the picture all that much. I don't think the Fed minutes changed anything at all here. We talk about some of the levels that we saw yesterday here. A market sell-off yesterday that seemed to be driven, I guess, less by macro, less by micro, and maybe just some good old-fashioned profit-taking. Who knows? It'll probably be some time before we finally figure it out, Scarlett. But to see a repeat of yesterday happening today, more or less, not quite as severe as what we saw yesterday, it does raise some concerns here about what's exactly going on under the hood. Yeah, well, maybe a little bit of a reversal from what we saw at the end of 2023. Uh, the 10-year yield notably did climb above 4% before reversing course pretty quickly. Yeah, so something to keep an eye on. Remember, we still got to get to the end of the month before we get another Fed meeting. Uh, we do have some earnings in between that, though. Uh, one of the bright spots over the last few days, though not necessarily today, had actually been Bitcoin, which, mm -hmm. of course, yesterday uh, bumped above 45000 I want you to flip up the board here because, of course, there's all this talk now about this Bitcoin ETF approval that could come as soon as uh, next week here. And I was taking a look at the uh, 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 net asset value discount between uh, sort of one of the main indexes, uh, ETFs that tracks this, uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust here. Uh, and you see that discount is really narrow. It is now only about 8%. And you go back just six months ago, uh, Scarlett, and that was like 44% here. So this is basically that bet here that that um, this is basically a proxy for a bet that that ETF is going to be approved. Yeah. Well, and of course, uh, we're waiting to hear all the details of those spot Bitcoin ETF approvals by January 10th, uh, which would be next week, next Wednesday. But it could happen before then. All right, let's take a look at some individual movers. I'm going to just change things up a little bit here because you talk about Bitcoin. Let's start with uh, Coinbase, uh, which, as you can see there, down more than 2%. But it's not just Coinbase. It's really all the Bitcoin-adjacent companies, exchanges, miners, proxies. They're all down. They're all tracking Bitcoin prices lower. Marathon Digital, Riot, CleanSpark, MicroStrategy. Well, what's interesting, though, I was looking at this. Marathon Digital is up today. And I, I thought it was like one of the one of the few that's sort of in that space that's actually higher. Did it, did it reverse course? Yeah, it's up two percent. But the, but what's interesting is they've kind of been outperforming. Even on the days where all of them up, it was rising more. Hmm. I'm not quite sure why. I don't know enough about about it to understand it. But it's kind of interesting to see that there are some winners. Remember yesterday when we had the rally, Coinbase remember was down. Yeah, kind of sat it out. Well, so. today th yeah. they're they're following. They're tracking largely Bitcoin yeah. prices overall. Let's uh, take a look at another company that is moving higher right now, and that's Dyn Therapeutics. It rallied as much as 43 percent. That is the biggest gain on record. This is a drug developer which announced initial data from trials of two of its therapies for patients with muscle diseases. Uh, it also has enough cash to fund operations through 2024, which uh, investors yeah. are taking as good news. Well, just real quickly, though, you had another one on there, SoFi, which I was mm -hmm. taking a look at earlier. That's, they're down like 13, 14 percent today. Yeah, on a KBW downgrade to the equivalent of sell. This is a stock that rose more than or more than doubled, actually, in 2023, 114 percent. So yeah. uh, KBW saying the recent rally took the stock's valuation to premium levels. Well, it's interesting, too, because I was looking at it. was like, it's basically at one point on the intraday it actually hit a record low on an intraday basis. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I didn't realize it was that dire, dire for right now. For yeah. Sofi. Well, right. in the absence of bigger news. All right. Stick with us. Our full cross-platform coverage of today's top stories. It starts right now. 
countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're joined right now by our colleagues Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik in the fishbowl, where we welcome our audiences across all of our platforms. We like fish around Bloomberg. I don't know if you got the memo about that. <laughs> I, I've heard. I've heard. Uh, I, I, do you? Do I, have you ever actually gone and just tapped on the glass? I don't. You're not supposed to do that. Oh, that you're not. The fish. Oh, is that what? Right, wait, are you talking about in our studio so when you tap on the glass? So you're the one that's stressing out the fish around here. You're the one stressing us out when you walk by and tap on the glass. Yeah, I know. I, I, I can't help it. Yeah. Well, speaking of stress, yeah. um, if you want to be wealthy, here's something you might want to consider. We're going to talk about markets in a moment, oh, but oh, well, okay. Sorry, I'm taking notes. Go ahead. <laughs> Bloomberg <laughs> opinion out with a column by our Tyler Cowen, and he says that you know you might want to try therapy in terms of how to improve your economic situation. It sounds kind of wonky, but what's really interesting is it really gets into emerging economies in particular, uh, some of the stresses, trauma by war and other situations, and that if you start to roll in maybe some kinds of different therapy, they talk about uh, psychological and psychotherapeutic infrastructure. We invest in so much else when we're trying to but develop... I'm confused. You're saying we should invest in therapy or invest or go to therapy ourselves? Well... So, uh, hey, well, be careful. The idea is when you're thinking about, I would never weigh in, but when you're thinking about, especially emerging economies where they face so many obstacles, yeah. we think about physical infrastructure investing there, but maybe you want to think about the psychological or therapy infrastructure of the individuals to help improve their situations. Okay. I just think it's an interesting thought. Yeah, it's, it is really interesting. I mean, Tyler Cowen studied, uh, cited a few studies here. One of the ones uh, that he cited was a study that they did in Ethiopia, Scarlet. Researchers showed one group of people short films about business and entrepreneurial success in the community. Six months later, the people who'd seen those films worked more, saved more, hmm. invested more in education relative to those who hadn't, and it actually held true for five years. I like that. It's kind of um, leaning into behavioral economics yes. and thinking yeah. broader than just exactly. um, you know the way that we so would normally go like about this. So this is like just casual reading, or is this like like Clockwork Orange, where they like you know tape your eyeballs. Whoa! Like, I mean, hopefully, and you, and just, hopefully casual. I yeah. Would, yeah and does it matter the movies? Like if I don't know, like if I go watch like The Big Short or something, does that get me there? I think we need to go to Starbucks and get uh, uh, <laughs> remain some eggs. Yeah. Okay. Do you think I, about I, it? This is fascinating. We're, we're having a good conversation. Well, you know what? Let's, let's bring move in Tyler on. Cowan to, let's to move answer on to that. Talk about, yeah, let's uh, talk about Starbucks eggs. because it wants to increase foot is traffic make in the afternoon hours. Did I, did I what? Are eggs going to make me smarter, Scarlett? Eggs will make you want to go to Starbucks between lunch and dinner, which is what they want you to do. Because hey, production team on the TV side, no more coffee for a minute. <laughs> After 11, no more. I thought we got the memo here. Take note, right? Yeah. yeah, the solution that Starbucks is proposing here is to boost its food business. It's expanding its food menu, adding two egg dishes, Romaine, chicken, maple butter, and an egg sandwich. Also some other things like a potato cheddar and chive bake. As uh, well. And then go to your cardiologist who will tell you not yeah. to eat it. Yeah, I'm not feeling that. But is this the idea is that this is going to get more people Didn't, in Starbucks? Yes. Because yes. last time in I walked by a Starbucks, right? it looked like there's no more room inside so there. Did the whole alcohol at Starbucks thing not work out that they tried a few years ago? Do you remember that? When I don't know. I feel like they tried something. Didn't they put like olive oil in the coffee last year and now they're trying this? Was that it, butter or olive oil? Uh, Starbucks know. owns the mornings. Oil. And the problem is they want to get people in later in the day. It's kind of like remember what McDonald's did with uh, all day breakfast a few years ago, right? Try to get those people to come in for breakfast breakfast to come in later. Uh -huh. Interesting. It's Hey, who knew? I didn't know this. The breakfast lineup of our Starbucks, um, I guess it accounts for half of the region's food business and about 8% of Starbucks total revenue. So it's a big mover, right? Yeah. It's a growth driver. Yeah. I don't I know. I really is. like those egg bites. Maybe you should just reduce the prices of the coffee. Maybe people can. <laughs> no. That is no. not a way. That is not a way to I'm getting increase nods revenue. in our studio that maybe. <laughs> you know, From you Starbucks' could just, perspective, You could just no. go to like the bodega down the street and for like a dollar, you know. Get coffee. Exactly. Or That's what I'm talking about. At Bloomberg. Real at Bloomberg. Cheese. Bloomberg cost me nothing. Bagel. Just saying. Be like a third of what you pay at Starbucks. But. All right. I don't know. You're fancy. Isn't it amazing? We had a conversation. We didn't even mention the Fed minutes. How'd that happen? We'll do that in the next hour. All right. Promises, promises. All right, guys. Um, we'll go get some eggs and therapy. Some therapy and yeah. we'll be back. At I like that. Eggs Street and therapy. Time. Uh, we'll join you. Uh, our cross-platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, and of course, Bloomberg Originals. We'll see you uh, for Beyond the Bell at 4 p.m. Wall Street time.
And we continue our markets coverage right here on Bloomberg Television. Counting you down to the closing bells. Those bells just a little more than 50 minutes away. Second trading day of the year. And, of course, a lot of debate right now about where markets go next and whether the Fed is going to be, I guess, a hindrance or maybe an aid to that. Stuart Kaiser joining us right now. He's the head of U.S. equity trading strategy over at City and joins us today here in Studio 2. Great to see you, Stuart. Hey, Roman. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I, you know, we, we were joking just a second with our radio colleagues how we didn't talk about the Fed minutes. We got the Fed minutes, kind of told us what we kind of knew already from the actual dot plot and, and the press conference uh, a few weeks ago here. But do you see a real conflict right now brewing between what the Fed is trying to telegraph and what the market wants to price in? I mean, it seems like the markets kind of embraced what the Fed had to say, probably because they liked what the Fed had to say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> if they yeah. didn't like it, they might have they yeah. might have pushed back a bit. But, you yeah. know, I, I would agree with you. I mean, the minutes largely as expected, kind of in line with the FOMC decision and also in line with kind of the pushback we got from other elements of the Fed in the immediate aftermath. So, mm-hmm. you know, not, not a lot of whole news here, uh, new news here. I think the market is kind of willing to embrace it. I think still a little bit of skepticism that they would actually cut into a strong economy. Mm-hmm. So I think if that did play out, it would be, you know, incrementally very positive for the markets. But, but otherwise, I think the Mark is kind of largely in line with what the Fed's saying. Are our rates for, for equity investors, are rates going to be at the center? of that story, of the center of those trades? I, I think they're at the center of it, but it's really, in our view, the why that matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if they have to cut rates because the economy is slowing and it looks like we're getting recessionary conditions, that, that's a much different situation than if, you know, we're printing 150 to 200,000 jobs and they're cutting into an otherwise solid economy. So mm-hmm. I do think rates matter quite a bit, but, but more so what's driving those rate cuts or those rate hikes. Mm-hmm. And it really does feel like here they're only going to hike again if inflation kind of inflects higher. Our view was they would only cut if growth slowed meaningfully, but they've now opened up this kind of third path, this kind of third off-ramp yeah. that will probably read very, very positive for markets. So how does that set us up for the jobs report on Friday? I know there's a couple of data points before the next FOMC meeting, but jobs and wage gains obviously top of mind for everyone. Yeah, I think, you know, big picture, we probably think Friday's data is going to come in, you know, supportive of markets. Consensus expects about 170,000 jobs. Our economists are at 190. So you're getting a solid, if not strong, jobs report. Uh, unemployment rate stays below 4%. Uh, average hourly earnings probably around 30 basis points. We think that kind of continues to thread the needle of, of a relatively strong economy, labor market holding in well, maybe easing, but easing very slowly and gradually. And, and frankly, that's what the Fed wants, right? They do want to loosen up the labor economy, but they certainly don't want to crater it. Right. So, you know, I would say Friday looks like it's going to be exactly what you would hope or, or expect to get out of the out of the jobs report. So would that be would those be conditions that are conducive for further gains in small caps? Because I look at the Russell 2000 today off by two and a quarter percent, vastly underperforming the, the big cap stocks. You wonder if the January effect is already over, even though we're only three days into it. Hey, you know, it's a good question. A lot of folks told us, hey, maybe the January effect got pre-traded in December. Um, that appears to not be the case because we have had leaders kind of underperforming laggards a little bit. A little a little bit to start the month. I think what you're getting is some positioning to start to start the year. You know, look, I would agree with you. If we if we definitely skip past and don't get a recession in the U.S., then that small cap equity or equal weighted S and P, which is the way that we like to position for that, I think is set up well to benefit from that because you're going to get a lower rate outlook, but you're getting that against a relatively strong growth backdrop, and and that's kind of the the ideal situation for a kind of U.S. domestically facing cyclical part of the market, which is where we would put small cap. I am curious, though, too. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about participation in the market, the idea that a lot of people moved to the sidelines over the last year or so. And the question is whether they come back. And I know there are a lot of metrics people look at, like money market accounts and say that's dry powder, although who knows how much of that would actually go back into equities. Do you see a lot of folks on the sidelines that you think could have a material impact on pricing if they come back? I, look, I, I share your skepticism a little bit. Yeah. I, I do think a lot of the money that went into money market accounts was actually money that would have otherwise sat in a bank account. So the question is, does that get dislodged and put yeah. into equity markets? You've added, call it $800 billion into retail money market funds in the last you know, 12 to 18 months. Yeah. Certainly some of that will come back into the market. So I think the question is how much could come back in. And look, if you're a retail investor, you'll be getting 5%, and it looks like you're going to be getting less than 5% on a go-forward basis. If you're not going into a recession, and frankly, you have a little bit of FOMO because you just saw the Nasdaq rise 50% 50 in the calendar year, I think there is some impetus to get some money back into the market. Mm -hmm. But but I agree, it's probably not a wall of money. It's it's probably a stream of money or, or something a little bit smaller. So it is a driver, but I would say probably not the number one. 
for What the about the stream of money that might go into a Bitcoin ETF <laughs> if and when the SEC approves it, possibly next week? Is it going to come from equities or is it going to come from those money market funds? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, like, I, Bitcoin has sort of proved to be a little bit of a risk, risk sentiment indicator, right? So I think if you are getting money into Bitcoin, part of it will be a supply demand story, which you've described off the ETF. But part of it would have to be, I think, you're in a pro-risk backdrop that gives people uh, you know, enough confidence to put money there. You know, we don't have a, a specific, specific view on, on Bitcoin or crypto, but I think if you get money in there, I think that would be money that would otherwise find its way into a risk asset as opposed to otherwise find its, its way into a savings account. I mean, this is a hundred volatility asset, right? It's, yes. it's, it's not what I would consider a safe haven. Well, for some people, but <laughs> those are different people. Stuart, thank you so much for joining us. Stuart Kaiser, the head of U.S. equity trading strategy over at Citi. Now, coming up on the close, new year, new you. Right, Romain? Uh, I guess. <laughs> it seems like everyone is looking to get back into the gym right now. We're going to talk to Barra Makrati. He's founder Sorry, and CEO of hints, Lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> they own and operate almost 200 fitness clubs. All right, and we're going to talk to Bruce Bond, co-founder and, co and CEO over at Innovator Capital Management, and we just launched a big new T ETF product. We'll have that conversation and also get his insights on the expected SEC approval of that spot, Bitcoin ETF. And as we head to the close, we're going to get insight on today's trading from David Sowerby, Portfolio Manager at Ancora Advisors. That's coming up on the close. This is Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close, less than 44 minutes until we get there, second trading day of the year, and well, second day of trading losses. Some green on the screen behind me. Let's hope these numbers are right today, but that's not going to be enough to outweigh the big downdraft that we continue to see among some of the more heavyweighted names out there. That includes names like Amazon, NVIDIA, and Apple. Tesla down about 4% here on the day. The net effect of it all is an S&P 500 down about 7 tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq doing a little bit better, but the big decliner today, believe it or not, is actually the Russell 2000. So a little bit of a sentiment change with some folks now, I guess, shunning the cyclicals just a little bit here and maybe just going back into safety. You see that reflected in the drop in yields today as prices in treasuries are being bid up here. And if you are looking for any sort of modicum of safety or even growth in the equity space itself, where well, you're going to find it in two areas, insurance, well, which is just kind of flatline now, and oil and gas stocks, which have been having a good day, tracking the big upswing that we've been seeing in crude prices, which are higher by about 3.5%, a little bit early in the day, Scarlett. All right. And of course, we'll continue to watch the markets for you. But it is a new year and getting into shape usually lands at the top of many New Year resolution lists. So, of course, it's a great time to take a closer look at the health of the fitness industry. I'm pleased to say joining us now is Barra Makrati. He is founder and CEO of Lifetime, which operates more than 160 luxury fitness clubs. Barra, happy new year to you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Scarlett. So uh, everyone starts the new year with big, big plans of staying active, of going to the gym and working out. What are you doing on your end at Lifetime to keep people attending your facilities, taking part in your programming beyond just the first two weeks of the year, the first month of the year? Yeah, it's a great question. We have literally changed our strategy two, three years ago. We really have zero promotions, no advertising, no marketing. The entire company's strategy is desirability for every type of program that we offer. So every club with all the programs, all the, the variety of different things they offer, the focus desirability, desirability, desirability. The results have been amazing. Uh, we're having a natural influx of customers coming in. They're paying the price that is you know, put on the uh, website. It's joining on, on, on their own. And the results has been just literally nothing short of fantastic. So it's a more organic approach and you're, you're avoiding any of these um, promotional uh, opportunities that your rivals would take on. Can you give me a better sense of what the numbers look like in terms of the influx at the start of the year? Yeah, typically you could expect in, in this industry about 1.2, 1.3 times the number of memberships you would sell without any promotion. If you don't, if you take out all the fluctuations that you could force out of it, if you just let the natural flow, you'll get for the first couple, two or three weeks of January, about 1.2, 1.2 and a half, 1.3 times the number of people joining. 
Uh, it's a strong acquisition month. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, it's started amazingly well with us uh, right now, even better than our expectation. I, I am curious about the competition for uh, at-home fitness, of course, which you know uh, became all the rage and during the pandemic because a lot of us had no other choices here. Did that sort of normalize? Did it sort of go back to sort of, I guess, the ratio that maybe we saw before the pandemic? Or did you see some attrition of folks who basically just decided they were better off just staying at home and, and riding a Peloton or whatever? You know, I have been consistent uh, because I have been doing this for 40 years and I understand why people come to an experiential athletic complex like ours. Uh, there has been zero, zero uh, concern that the customer would go and not come back. Uh, that would have been maybe five or 10% of the customer base. It wouldn't be anything beyond that. Uh, but then there has been a whole new group of people who have been wanting to come in. Uh, our visits to the clubs are caught up to what they used to be pre-COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we had maximum visitation in the clubs. I'm almost at capacity in most of the clubs. And we were able to rejig that with basically focusing on more experiential, zero promotional for the last three, four years, and really play the game like yeah. the organizations like Chanel, Louis Vuitton, yeah. uh, Four Seasons, Ritz-Carlton. And that's the way Lifetime has repositioned itself in a universal way, and we are seeing exactly the results we're looking for and then yeah. some. Well, anyone who's been to some of your facilities knows, I mean, as far as gyms goes, I think calling it a gym might be an understatement uh, in terms of what it offers, but it's also a lot of real estate. And I do notice that a lot of your uh, locations are in more suburban areas, not necessarily in some of the more, I guess, higher cost urban areas. And I'm wondering though, if that changes, given some of the weakness that we've seen in the commercial real estate market, whether that is something that could actually work to your advantage in terms of finding new locations. It, it's been that, Romain, and also on top of that is the strategy lifetime played out in proving in the malls, uh, in buildings, that uh, in uh, living uh, situations like an apartment building, is the, the value of lifetime brand with more than 150 billion impressions, uh, our NPS that is in the 50s. That, that value, it bring in, it's just truly lifetime is either the amenity or the anchor uh, in the mall situation. So we're able to penetrate the urban markets mm -hmm. with the rents that we want to pay, not the market rent for that per square foot. An Got office it. market is yet another market that is going to provide opportunity for our company. So Baram, a final question to you, of course, and it has to do with those weight loss drugs. What impact are you seeing already on your company and on the industry and how temporary or how permanent do you, do you see it lasting? Okay, so this is, uh, this is just more of an assumption by people who kind of cook things in their head. We haven't seen any impact, zero, of somebody not coming, joining our club because of the drugs. That's, that's a fact. The reality is in our business, because of this experiential, healthy way of life, destination for health and wellness, uh, we, we are getting all kinds of people coming in. The issue is that these drugs, you know, we have experts. We mm -hmm. also have launched Miora which is a facility that does everything longevity right. in first location in Minnesota. And so it needs to actually go hand in hand. If you are yeah. taking these drugs, you must be doing weight training. So it actually will help the clubs. It, might, it will not hurt the clubs. So that's um, a total misunderstanding. Bon, thank you so much. We got to leave it there. Bon McCrady of Lifetime joining us on the state of the fitness industry. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Coming Thanks. up, home prices in Manhattan on the rise once again. This is The Close on Bloomberg. For the first time in more than a year, home prices for high-end Manhattan properties rose. They were up 5.1% from last year. Sales closed at a median of $1.16 million. Although, Romain, it should be worth noting that more than two-thirds of Manhattan buyers paid cash as well because rates, however much they've fallen, are still pretty high. Yeah, well, if you're in the market for a seven-figure uh, home, I, I would think that you probably have the resources to, to maybe uh, pony up that up in cash. I, I guess this is a good thing. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, of course, you know, we all have a competing interest in maybe seeing 
and prices moderate yeah. a little bit to a certain extent. But but we, but in all seriousness, you go back to all the gloom and doom. New York is over. We're never coming back. And that's that, silliness. That has not this is the financial out. capital of the yeah. world. There's always going to be a rotation of people coming in and out. At the end of the day, you're still going to pay through the nose for property here. And, and that's great, what's starting to happen yeah. once again. <laughs> <laughs> this is a close on Bloomberg. Keep it right here. Market close coming up next. This is the countdown to the close. Just about 30 minutes to go here in the trading day. And it looks like a bit of a repeat of what we saw yesterday, though. And this time, it's the Russell 2000 that's all the way at the bottom. Yes. So everything else is also in the room. Underperforming. <laughs> yeah. yeah, two days of tra two trading days of 2024 and two losses for 2024 so far. When you look at the big pie, that is the S&P 500, the big cap universe, you can see most sectors are in the red, led by real estate investment trusts and consumer discretionary and industrials, all of them down by at least one and a quarter percent. Bucking the decline, energy stocks gaining 1.7% as a group as oil prices rise and communication services also higher but barely by a third of 1%. So very much a down day here, Romaine. Well, since you ended on a high note, I guess I will start on a high note here and take a look at the top two names at the top of the screen here. A Citigroup having a phenomenal day. Remember, it rallied 3% yesterday, adding about 2% today. We had Mike Mayo on yesterday really talking about this whole idea of the potential for that stock to double over the next three years, maybe even triple in his most bullish case scenario. It's a lot of positive chatter right now about some of the changes Jane Frazier has made to sort of slim down that company and make it a little bit more efficient. Johnson & Johnson also higher on the day, only fractionally seven-tenths of a percent, but that's an eight-day run for the stock. That's the longest a daily win streak for that stock going all the way back to mid-2020. Now, the flip side of that is what you're seeing in American Airlines, down for a seventh straight day. I think that's its worst day going back to 2021, down about 3.6% here. No real news here, but we've seen a lot of softness in a lot of the travel stocks. That includes the cruise lines, which are also down again today. And AMC down about 8.5% here on the day. B. Riley yesterday actually cut its price targets for AMC, Cinemark, IMAX, and a few other movie theater chains, saying basically the box office receipts that we had in 2023 of about $9 billion, that's not going to hold up in 2020. In fact, Bloomberg Intelligence, Scarlett, says it actually could come in at around $8 billion this year, which would be about 30 percent below pre-pandemic levels. All right. We'll keep an eye on that. Let's move over to the ETF industry now because Innovator Capital Management has just launched a new ETF for the new year. The company says its equity-defined protection ETF is designed to offer exposure to the market's upside potential while mitigating losses. So joining us now to discuss that and more within the ETF universe is Bruce Bond. Bruce is co-founder and CEO of Innovator Capital Management and Innovator ETS. Bruce, Happy New Year to you. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit more about this ETF, Equity Defined Protection ETF. The ticker is AJAN. What does it actually hold? Well, it holds options in there, but I think the key of the product is it's really the first ETF that allows you to participate in the market to the upside up to 15, 16 percent over two years with no risk on the downside. And that's really a, a huge development within the ETF space. And when we looked at the opportunity there versus market link CDs or fixed index annuities and how much assets are going into those categories, we felt like an ETF, kind of this new technology in the ETF structure is really the way to bring that out to people that are fearful of the markets. I mean, yeah. there's, I think, six trillion dollars in money markets mm -hmm. right now so why is so much money sitting in money markets we had a great year last year people are fearful potentially the market could go down in the following year or two so this is a way they can get that money to work they can participate in the market up to 15 percent upside in the market without risk of downside and that's why we really are excited about this potential product so the idea is to remove the timing aspect of timing the market and to get some of that money that's on the sidelines in. What's been the reaction, the response so far? There, there's been a great response so far. I mean, there hasn't been a product like this available, as I mentioned. And there are, is so many people, I mean, we know that if we invest in the S&P 500, the market goes up through times, but there's some people that just aren't willing to take that risk. You know, 75% of the investable assets are in 55 plus hands right now. Mm -hmm. They're realizing even with a 60-40, what we saw over the last couple of years, they can't withstand a significant drawdown in here. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, you know what? I'll take 
you know, 15, 16% over the next two years without risk on the downside versus just taking that risk and being in the market and what I call being naked in the market. You know, you're just in the market and you just flow wherever it goes. Well, I mean, on that point about being naked, so I assume the options are baked into this as as effectively the edge, right? Yeah, right. So as as I'm sure you know, there are a lot of people when they hear the word options, it's like, ooh, very spooky, at least for for lay people. Um, So how do you sort of uh, address that when you're marketing this, whether it's to the investment advisors or directly to uh, the the customers? How do you sort of get that across here, that what's being baked in here is not necessarily that boogeyman under the bed? Well, uh, I think the beauty of it is, is that at Innovator, we have the broadest lineup available. We've had over two hundred uh, completed outcome periods, which would be like this two-year period or a one-year period, and all of them have done exactly what we've said. And so people are getting more and more comfortable with options, but by and large, most advisors even are not licensed to be able to use options. Mm-hmm. And so the beauty of this is Innovator is with the work, uh, the help of Milliman, who helps us sub-advise these portfolios, put together this package that will deliver mm. on this particular day in yeah. two years. And so it's all done professionally. It's not something people need to worry about. Uh, I am curious. Uh, I, I do want to pivot a little bit here. And maybe let's talk about those people who aren't as worried about risks, uh, those people yeah. who are willing to sort of go out there uh, and take risks. We've seen a lot of activity in the crypto space over the last few months in anticipation of a spot Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. Uh, I guess, A, do you think that's going to happen? And B, are there products that you plan to offer should that happen? Well, A, I do think it's definitely going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of Mm. people lined up to bring these products. Mm. And I think it will be a really big launch within the ETF industry. It's not something we have filed right now. So we're Mm. not planning on bringing any at this moment or we don't haven't filed any to bring at this moment. Mm. But I think one reason I think is so large is if you think we have a lot of ways to access bonds and equities, but we have very few ways to access crypto in a reliable way. And so because an ETF becomes available now, there are other avenues that are traded like GBTC that you could buy, but you're subject to, you know, uh, you know, uh, the. the inflation of the products and things yeah. like that. and there's and been so, a huge disconnect. Yeah, between right, a huge yeah. disconnect yeah. of the value of Bitcoin yeah. and the value of the trust and where the trust yeah. trades. This spot Bitcoin will trade right on top of the, the value of Bitcoin, mm-hmm. and I think we'll get people very comfortable very quickly with this space. Once it launches and when it gathers momentum and becomes a thing on it in and of itself, what loses out? Is it necessarily GBTC that you mentioned or um, BETO, which is a ProShares Bitcoin strategy ETF, which invests in Bitcoin futures, or is it going to be equities and, and something more conventional? Um, I, I think that it will primarily be a bit oh, will probably lose out. I mean, th- people went to that because that's what was available to yep. give to them at the time in an ETF. But I think it's subpar to actually a spot, a spot Bitcoin. And so I think some assets will flow there. And I think some will come out of equities as well. You know, kind of the high growth part of the equity market, the tech part, it tends to correlate a little bit with tech. And so I think some can come from there as well. I am curious about the demographic changes. You mentioned a little bit earlier in the interview how a lot of most assets now are held by folks who are basically over 55. Yeah. Uh, Has that also changed, I guess, what they hold? And by that, I mean, you know, the traditional was, you know, you had this portfolio of mutual funds effectively. And Mm -hmm. now, of course, that shifted a little bit more to ETFs. But are you seeing greater adoption of that within those retirement plans? Well, not yeah. within the retirement plans themselves. Yeah. Um, it's still a difficult place for ETFs to operate in yeah. because of you know the structure of, of yeah. how they work. And, and so, but outside of that, you're seeing an enormous amount of money come into the ETF space. Yeah. It's far outpacing the mutual fund space. And I think in time, when that happens, we will start to see uh, ETFs take well, over. Well, that's that what I'm curious is that when we see greater adoption. Does that require regulatory changes to sort of facilitate that? Yeah, it's more structural changes, structural, really. It's okay. h- it's how the, pans are, uh, the yeah. plans are paid for yeah. and all the compensation involved in there. ETFs are very thinly, you know, they're yeah. very inexpensive. Therefore, there's not a lot of money to pass around like there are with mutual funds. Mm-hmm. And I think those are some of the challenges yeah. why you don't see them as readily available. There are some self-directed plans that you can get it in. But I think by and large, you know, it's still mutual funds rule that world. Yeah. Yeah, it's still uh, coming at the expense of mutual funds, the old industry. Bruce, really appreciate your joining us today. Bruce yeah, Bond, thank you very much a pioneer for in the ETF industry. He is a uh, founder and co-founder, excuse me, uh, and CEO of Innovator Capital Management. 
Now, coming up on The Close, the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's biggest stories. This is The Close. We'll be right back. It's time now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the people at the center of the day's top stories. And Romaine, I'm watching David Tepper, the billionaire investor who also owns the Carolina Panthers. The NFL yeah. fined him. Are they him. any good? No, that's uh, a problem. Uh, yeah, they fined him $300,000 after he was caught on video throwing a drink on an imposing fan uh, in frustration because his team lost to Jacksonville 26 nothing. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I don't think you should throw things at people uh, that, as good. a general rule. Yeah. Uh, be polite. Also, he owns his team, right? Yes. Uh, and, and, they, and they're and they awful. They're like two and like 14 or something, right? They got beat by the Jacksonville Jaguars, who, I mean, I guess they're a decent team this year. I mean, they're at the top of the standings here. Is there any other way that he could have vented his frustrations that would have been more constructive to take the Carolina Panthers from two and 14 to something a little bit more respectable? That, that's a, I'm sure that's something that he's struggling with right now. Yeah, under his ownership, the team has a 31-67 yeah. record. It's posted six straight losing seasons. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so maybe That'd he should be, frustrating. be throwing that drink at himself. Uh, I'm keeping oh. an eye on uh, somebody uh, myself. Uh, maybe he needs to be throwing drinks at somebody. Uh, I'm Bob sure Iger. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he wants to throw drinks at a lot of people here. Of course, Nelson Peltz and a lot of activist investors have really been circling around this company, trying to agitate for change, including change and leadership. Now Bob Iger circling the wagons as well striking a deal with Value Act uh, for board seats, as well as with Blackwell's Capital, uh, which is going to nominate three folks to the board. Now, we should point out Blackwell's came out with a statement a little bit later, kind of walking back some of that, saying we're not completely <laughs> on the camp here, but we do want a little bit more of a say. But the idea is here, he seems to really be trying to sort of bolster up um, people around him yes. so he can execute on a vision that, I, let's face it, he's only been, what, there a year now since he or since his return. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, he's insulating just, himself, yeah. buying himself some time and some yeah. room to be able to um, execute yeah. on his, his or Maybe he could put David Tepper on the board. <laughs> well, you know who is going to be on the board is James Gorman, uh, the former Morgan Stanley CEO, now executive chairman of the firm. He actually weighed in on the Disney drama. He's going to be joining the board in February. Take a listen. Bob Iger is a phenomenal executive. I mean, he is uh, iconic for a reason. He's led that company uh, through so many cycles and uh, really is a gifted leader. So it's a great pleasure to work with him, but it's not for me to judge Disney's future. I haven't joined the board yet. So he says, it's not for me to judge Walt Disney Company's future yet, but it will be soon because he's joining the board. Uh, yeah, in about a month's time, he's going to have a big say in that. And I'm, look, and I'm sure he's obviously well respected as an executive and he'll, I'm sure uh, Iger, whether he wants to or not, is going to listen to him. Just Former just management consultant. This is his yeah, wheelhouse, right? Absolutely. And they have a relationship, we should point out, uh, from the past uh, in terms of deals that they mm -hmm. worked on. So uh, this is, he's going to be very familiar with uh, both of these men with each other. Yeah. All right. We've got a lot more coming up. The closing bell's next. Yeah. David Sowerby, Ancora Managing Director and Portfolio Manager, going to be stopping by the big program with about 14 minutes until the closing bell. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu with about 10 minutes until we get to these closing bells here. A stock's off session lows, but still pretty deep in the red here. Second straight day of losses for the major indices. Yeah, and uh, especially if you look at the Russell 2000, really lagging behind the big cap stocks here. That uh, smaller cap index is off by 2.5%. But you're looking at three straight days of losses for the S&P 500. The 10-year yield, interestingly enough, um, climbed above 4% and then quickly reversed course. And it wasn't tied at all to the Fed minutes, the FOMC minutes, which came out, which pretty much told us what we already knew. Yeah, those Fed minutes, just kind of a ratification of that, as they typically are here. But it does make you wonder about some of the rotation and repositioning that we're seeing in this market, whether there is something really tangible driving that or whether this is, you know, folks sort of making changes for tax reasons mm -hmm. or just simply taking profits after a phenomenal 2023. Let's see what our next guest thinks. David Sauer will be joining us right now, Ancora Managing Director and Portfolio Manager, to help us count down to those closing bells, David. And I'll pose that question to you here. I know two days doesn't necessarily make a trend here, but <laughs> is some of the price action we're seeing, is that just simply, hey, you know, if you made 40, 50 percent on the market last year, why not take some chips off the table, pay your taxes and move on? 
that that's it, Romaine. Taxes in particular. Maybe you didn't want to sell at year end and take your gain in 2023. So you're selling in early 2024, knowing you have a full year ahead of you uh, for tax consequences. But but I'll take a step back and say, back on November 1st, sentiment got unusually bearish, which is a good buy signal. Stocks have rallied 12 percent since that buy signal on November 1st. But lo and behold, in the 12 months after sentiment goes very bearish, the average return for the S&P 500 is a little better than 20 percent. So we're 12 percent to the good side with potentially more to go. We just know it's not a straight up uh, move from here on uh, for, for the rest of this year. Well, that brings us to the question, though, as to sort of if the market does meaningfully move higher, what is going to lead us at? Is it going to be a repeat of what we saw in the first six, seven months of last year, where it was just basically Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA, et cetera? I don't think so. And for, for this reason, if you look at that Magnificent Seven, their valuations trade at about a 40 percent premium above the rest of the 493 stocks in the S&P 500, and in particular valuation on a price to sales and price to free cash flow. At the same time, their profit margins did not increase as commensurate with their valuation increase. So it tells me that they probably won't be the leaders this year. I don't know when exactly it's going to turn, but it's turning. And you want to look at uh, more of a all cap and in particular look down into small caps as the potential for better returns this year. And a lot of people have been doing that. We saw that at the end of December. The question is, has that run its course already? Because the January effect starts to really come into its own in the middle of December. I don't think so. Uh, small caps have only traded this discounted to their large cap siblings about 11% of the time. Their earnings growth will probably come pretty close to matching large cap stocks next year when you look at the median small cap company and given just how much large caps have dominated for the last five plus years th this rally in small caps i think has a better than year ahead of it maybe a two to three year run well the earnings season that's coming up with jp morgan starting to report on january 12th validate that move up in small caps i i think so along with the fact that high yield spreads continue to stay tight the fed we know is at least going to be friendlier in 2024. That bodes well for small caps. And when you look at the valuation as the key component, I, I think that's where you want to continue to be migrating uh, meaningful parts of your portfolio into all cap and small cap and not the beloved Magnificent Seven. Uh, let's talk about another sector, and that's healthcare. And I've been kind of intrigued by this because, of course, we kind of think of healthcare as kind of a defensive sector. But uh, we've had some folks on this program, including today alone, who've kind of looked at it more as a growth play. And I'm wondering if you see it the same way. Uh, a good weighting in, in healthcare. And when you think about the more defensives or reliables, whether it's consumer staples, utilities, or healthcare, I'm going to lean to the healthcare side given I'm able to get a lot of free cash flow. Uh, big cap name to give you one is AbbVie. They've, um, they've done a couple acquisitions, both in, um, in mental health as well as uh, oncology to go with their longer term drug solutions like Rinvoc and SkyRizzy. I think AbbVie at a free cash flow yield on a valuation basis of six or 7% compares very favorably to the rest of the market and why it's the largest healthcare holding in the mutual fund I co-manage. So, David, I want to ask you about something that you wrote in your note to us, which is we had a better bond market in the fourth quarter. And, of course, everyone thought at the start of last year that it was going to be the year of the bond. That didn't really play out according to plan. But you say going forward, one of the biggest challenges that bond investors still face is the U.S. aggregate bond index, better known as the ag. Why is that? Explain that. Well, far be it for this stock portfolio manager to weigh in on the bond market, but with the yield on the Bloomberg aggregate at about four and a half percent and the duration better than six years, I want to see a closer match between yield and duration to get more excited about the bond market. It, it can be respectable in 2024 after a good fourth quarter last year. But I think given the free cash flow yields I can get in the stock market mm -hmm. relative to that four percent in the bond market, I like my odds in stocks. <laughs> a stock man to the very end. How are you thinking about uh, events like the Bitcoin ETF that may be approved next week? What kind of disruption might it cause in the rest of the equity market? 
It, it will. It, it's more likely to be noise, some short-term buying. Uh, I'll take a step back and say, if Bitcoin rallies, I'm willing to sit on the sidelines. I still have a t hard time as a uh, person who pays a great heed to valuation to how I value the, these names. But but as a, maybe an, as an aside to, to Bitcoin, is just think about commodity prices are down 30% from 18 months ago. And you're starting to see a weaker dollar, lower interest rates, a mismatch between supply and demand that's going to increase demand. So if you don't buy Bitcoin or, or cryptos, look at commodities as a place where you can see 10 to 15% price appreciation this year. So we'll save a little bit of that cryptocurrency for commodities. All right, David, always great to catch up with you. David Sowerby over at Ancora, helping us uh, count us down to those closing bells. Just about three minutes to go here. We should point out that while he was speaking, Scarlett, stocks uh, did hit fresh session lows. In fact, I was taking a look at the S&P 500, uh, which, remember, it punched through above that 4,600 level back mm -hmm. right at the start of December. It did actually trade below that level uh, at one point, 4,700 level, I should say, uh, just a little while ago here, though it's now holding at 4,706. Yeah, 4,699. And again, I, I come back to this because there's so much talk about how the Russell 2000 is going to get some love this time around, off by 2.6% right now. 2.6% here on the Russell. The Nasdaq down about a percent here on the day. A bid coming in to bonds here, and believe it or not, a bid coming in to some commodities. We are moving closer to those closing bells where we have our full market coverage of everything that went on right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic. Welcome to our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms. That includes television, radio, Bloomberg Originals, as well as our partnership with YouTube. Second straight day uh, of trading here uh, in the U.S. equity markets and second straight day of losses, Carol Masser. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to a, a place that you like to talk a lot about is the Russell 2000. I mean, it's down about 2.6%. So if you're looking for some underperformance, as you said, down really across the board. But man, the small cap's really taking a hit today. Yeah, Dave Donabedian uh, over at CIBC Private Wealth Management, we just spoke to him, Scarlett, and he reminded us, look, you know, you had nine straight weeks of gains uh, for U.S. stocks at the end of the year. It's about time that stocks take a breather. Still, he is a little concerned about valuation multiples right now, and he thinks that earnings are not going to match. So he does expect more of a pullback. But he does say that once the Fed starts to cut rates, he could we could see a sustained rally that uh, could last uh, years. For all the valuation concerns that people cite, though, it's usually on the big cap side and it's usually on the Magnificent Seven side. They're all saying that uh, the Russell 2000, the small caps, they are looking pretty attractive. It's just a matter of uh, waiting out this period where there's uncertainty and you have to get more people on board. It'll be interesting, too, when we see participation pick back up and volume pick back up as we get into, I guess, sort of uh, the more meat of the month. That, of course, includes the jobs report this Friday, our earnings, which are going to start in roughly about two weeks' time, and then, of course, another Fed meeting uh, at the end of the month here. So there will be a lot of catalysts here. The question is whether that catalyst will be to the upside or the downside. We are getting the closing bells here uh, in New York. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which yesterday actually escaped having a losing day, not going to escape it today. It is lower on the day by about seven tenths of a percent here as we wait for these numbers to settle. That's basically down about 285 points, right around that 37,430 level. Meanwhile, the S&P 500, which did trade below 4,700, is going to close just above it today, but it's still down 38 points or about eight tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq composite down 173 points or about 1.2 percent. And Carol was just talking about it. Let's talk about it. The Russell 2000, a 53, 54 point decline here, 2.6 percent. That is, Carol Masser, yeah. the biggest one day decline for the Russell 2000 mm. since March of 2023. That's a big move to the downside. That's huge. Talk, right. You know, yeah. when we think about technicians and what they watch, you know, that feels like a technical move to some extent. But we'll see if it continues, Scarlett, to build momentum. Having said that, back to the big caps we go. And Scarlett, you definitely saw a risk off trade. Wait, can I just point out, sorry, not what? to interrupt you no, before please. you move on to big caps, but yeah. I was just looking because you, the, the technical levels did get breached to the downside today. And you had did. The Russell yeah. go below that 20-day and some of those other, you know, those esoteric ones like Fibonacci and all that stuff that I don't really understand also have breached some of those levels to the downside as well. That yeah, would explain I'll pull up, the price action, yeah. Yeah, pull up RSI. You know, we definitely were overbought. We know that. Everybody keeps saying that about equities. But you look at it and it definitely pulled off significantly off that oversold level, guys.
All right. Um, in, in looking at the Russell 2000, by the way, all 11 industry groups finishing in the red. When it comes to the big caps, and this is what you're looking at here, the S&P 500 and its two dozen industry groups, autos and components, real estate investment trusts, and consumer durable and apparel leading the way down. On the upside, you had energy stocks as oil prices staged a rebound. Telecom names and utilities, definitely more of a defensive tilt there uh, among the gainers. Well, you know, and if you wanted to do well, if you were a bull or trying to be a bull in this market, as you just mentioned, Scarlett, and Energy, the top performing group in the, in the S&P 500, definitely a bright spot, which brings me to Marathon Petroleum, uh, with a gain of about 3.6%, up as much as 5% at its highs in today's session, but still closing the day uh, up 3.6%. Number one gainer in the S&P 500. Uh, I do believe it might have yeah. been actually, a record I, I, close. Yeah, I just correct you. Um, it's number two gainer. Eli number Lilly two. actually uh, surged into trading. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. All right, number two gainer. It was number That's one. That's fine. Now, it's only your first correction of 2020. I want to see... Romaine, I want to see your launch pad. Like, I want to see your screen that you've created that Wait, you just know all this stuff. Where's my white flag? Where's like, uh, my white flag? That's what, that's what I want for, 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 for New Year's. All it's right. just like, yeah. It was among the top in the S&P. It was go. number one. Go. Now it's number two. Um, anyway, a bright spot. We know that there's and, tensions in the middle. Not, to, not, to, not to interrupt again, but, but <laughs> I just, but I was, but I was looking. Can we get and, Romaine's wife on the phone? In all seriousness, in all seriousness, <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm going through the biggest yeah. gainers in the S&P. And I mean, it's all basically oil and gas. Yeah. I mean, with the Eli Lilly and Junipers thrown in there, but basically the top 20 uh, names are, uh, I think uh, 16 of them are energy stocks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, which brings me to another one. I'm just waiting if he's going to interrupt. No, Suncor no. Energy was also outperforming 5.8%. Um, this oil producer <laughs> said fourth quarter Behave. upstream production was uh, 808,000 barrels per day. BMO Capital Markets said it was a positive surprise. So we saw some momentum, uh, some specific fundamental uh, momentum to the upside for that name. And I just want to go to when we look at our performance today, we did see, I haven't done this in a while, first time for the new year, NASDAQ Golden Dragon China Index. Uh, Whoa, <laughs> only two days in. <laughs> it's back. She waited. She waited. See something she can just like count on. Uh, we did see Pinduo Duo. It was among the top in the NASDAQ 100 uh, Chinese online retailer. What's interesting is China once again trying to bring some investor sentiment back. They uh, approached some of the gaming regulations there, uh, looking at some of the damage that's been caused in that sector because of harsh new gaming regulations. They did um, fire, I think it was their chief publicity uh, department head. Uh, and so maybe getting rid of that person. So, uh, I don't know, the back and forth in China, but nonetheless, there was some outperformance there. Okay, I'm done. Okay, let's look at underperformance. I want to start with Apple. It's worth checking in on shares of Apple after yesterday's route. Another down day for Apple. Fair shares finishing down more than seven tenths of one percent. Uh, the company uh, is down four percent, more than four uh, percent, just in the last two trading sessions. Uh, reminder: Apple was up just about fifty percent last year. And then American Airlines actually uh, down for a seventh day in a row today. Longest losing streak in more than two years. Down three point seven. Percent uh, over the last seven days, it's down nearly 10 percent compared to the S&P 500, which is down uh, less than one percent over that same period. And then uh, this is a really interesting one: ticker MTN Vail Resorts. They uh, own and operate more than 40 ski resorts around the world, many of them uh, in the east of the U.S. and in the west of the United States, uh, including Vail, Beaver Creek, Park City, Breckenridge, Whistler, Blackcomb, Stowe, Okemo, and more. Shares finished the day down close to two percent. Uh, Barclays came out and said that the underwhelming ski conditions they've been seeing in much of the U.S. Uh, spurred by warmer than average temperatures threatened to reduce the company's full year earnings. So we're seeing uh, some weather wow. and maybe climate change. Snow what snow, right? Exactly. I went to Okimo over How the holidays. Was it? It was raining the entire time, yeah. um, oh. and there were just bare grass everywhere. Did you everywhere. see? Did you see the pictures from Whistler uh, no. in in the late part of December? There was like rain at the top of Whistler. I mean, this is an area of the of the country that, or of, of Canada, I should say, that gets like a lot of snow typically around this time. And should be covered in white. At should this be point. covered, yeah. And it's been it's been pretty bad. Colorado has uh, like sixty to seventy percent of average snowpack right now. Uh, which is okay, according to the National Weather Service, uh, but Utah has about 50 to 60 percent. Well, it's supposed right to now. snow this weekend, right? Here in New York. In the Northeast, but, I mean, yeah. So, we're talking like so a guys, there's inches. this thing called climate change, and 
Yeah. I mean, it's really pretty sad it's in really terms sad. of some of the severe weather conditions that you're seeing and just not seasonal. I think I thought about it on Christmas Day. I don't know. It's like it was kind of warm around here. And I, I don't know, growing up, it used to be pretty Yeah, warm. and it's not just like, you know, the skiing activities. I mean, no. you, we talked to so many at Bloomberg, so many uh, farmers and people in the agriculture industry that tell you that corn belt has already shifted north. And you've got a lot of other parts of the country now that are having to grapple with uh, trying to grow things that maybe they wouldn't have grown in the past. Um, I do want to talk Canal. about. Can I just say Panama Canal, great Bloomberg, big take. Yeah, that was a fantastic story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that the problems and, that they're having because of the low water levels and oh, getting trade through there. Um, can we talk about, but it's interesting too, because yeah. I mean, they, I mean, this is like the engine of their economy. I mean, it's basically yeah. their entire economy more yep. or less. And now they want to sort of cut off, I got the name of that river that they want to dam up to try to get the water back in there. But then of course that hurts all the people who rely on that river for agriculture stuff. So it's, like it's a huge, yeah, it's a huge catch 22 here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Um, before uh, we move on, I do want to talk about yields. Can we okay. do that? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, actually, they didn't do a whole lot today, but it was interesting, <laughs> though, to see. You can still talk about them. But, yeah, but, well, it's interesting to see the reversal from yesterday here because we did see those yields spike pretty high yesterday here. Now, the two-year yield did move slightly higher, but you see that's basically less than a basis point there. Meanwhile, the rest of the yield space moved lower here, so you did see a bid come in, I think, to the longer end of the curve, which I thought was interesting here. Yep. So if that was a safety trade or, if men, if this gets more to that rotation mm -hmm. idea of of people cashing out of equities and then trying to find a place to park that cash that's uh, a little protected. Uh, maybe that explains this, but it's going to be a few days, I think, before we get a clearer picture here of what this price action uh, is really telling us. Romain, I am a little surprised the way that yields ended the day, especially the 10-year, which hit 4% earlier and then mm -hmm. moved mm -hmm. lower after we saw the uh, minutes from the Fed meeting. Well, apparently, within the minutes of the Fed meeting, even though Jay Powell didn't say a whole lot about quantitative tightening and the balance sheet, there were some suggestions by participants that it'd be appropriate to begin discussing technical factors that would determine when uh, the Fed starts to slow down the pace of quantitative tightening. And when it does that, that is another form of easing. So um, that's starting to come back into the conversation here. Yeah, listen, I agree with um, Romaine. I don't agree with him on a lot of things, but I do agree with him on this, is that I think it's going to take a while for us to settle in terms of where rates are supposed to be. I think it was overdone to the downside. I think a lot of folks are weighing in on that expectation um, and that maybe a 4% level makes more sense or a little bit above it. But I guess ultimately with the data points, um, how they start to play out and we'll get an idea starting on Friday, right? In terms of that monthly jobs report. I disagree with Carol. <laughs> Your wife's Just for calling. the principle of it. She and I are going to talk later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, that is a wrap. Our cross-platform coverage, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, uh, our second trading day of 2024. Wrapped up. Beyond the Bell. We'll see you tomorrow. And a lot more coming up here on Bloomberg Television, right here on The Close, a look at the municipal market, as well as a look ahead to that big jobs report on Friday. That's coming up next right here on Bloomberg. Welcome back to the close. It was a pretty interesting day in U.S. equity markets once again. Second trading day of the year. And we kind of saw a repeat of what we had yesterday here with a pretty big sell-off across the board. Though things did flip up a little bit. Yesterday, it was the NASDAQ and the big cap tech stocks that really got sold hard. Today, it was a little bit more of the small caps and that Russell 2000. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Russell a little bit later this hour here. But I want to bring into the conversation uh, Gina Martin-Adams, who's going to be my co-pilot for the next hour here. Uh, she's our, our chief uh, equity strategist down at Bloomberg Intelligence. And I, I know, you know, one day of trading, two days of trading isn't necessarily the end all to be all of where the trend goes here. But is there something afoot here in terms of what people are selling or mo maybe what people are rotating into? Yeah, I think there's a little yeah. bit of something to be said for how we've started this year. First of all, we started this year way too optimistic. Mm -hmm. Our market pulse index gives us a reading on sentiment on the equity market, and we were manic mm -hmm. headed into this year. Yeah. So as of December 31st, we were significantly overbought and due for some kind of cool down period. And today was very telling because of the reaction to the Fed minutes, which does sell, tell you once again, this really is all about yields. The market mm -hmm. rallied as yields fell. If there is some question as to whether or not the Fed is going to be able to reverse interest rate policy as quickly as the bond market had anticipated, that's going to follow through into the equity market. Mm -hmm. And then you have seen some defensive rotation. Um, one of the things that we call out in our monthly assessment of overall market trends is what's happening with cyclical versus defensive sectors. Utilities are usually one of the market's tells. We never talk about utilities, but nonetheless, if utilities mm -hmm. are starting to rally, 
uh, and utilities did not make at least a lower low in December's action, which yeah. is telling about where markets were sort of headed coming into 2024. And that is a bit of defensive rotation here, mm -hmm. a bit of selling of some former winners, and generally selling this, the story of yields being lower for longer. All right, uh, Gina Martin-Adams, uh, she's sticking with us uh, for the full hour here. And let's continue on that theme right now in terms of where rates have gone and the effect that it's had on a variety of asset classes. And we're going to go right now to our Muni moment, uh, something we do, of course, uh, once a week at a special time today. And I'm going to get an outlook for the year ahead out of Jennifer Johnston. She's director of municipal bond research over at Franklin Templeton. Happy New Year, Jennifer. Great to see Happy you. Happy New Year to you as well. Uh, let's talk about the returns that we saw in the municipal bond market, particularly towards the end of the year, we saw a huge ramp up in uh, price activity, uh, a big rally into the end of the year, and a lot of questions right now as to whether that rally can continue in 2024. So that's exactly what we keep asking ourselves as well. We think the market is really well positioned to get investors back in. Investors have been on the sideline. They've been invested in treasuries and cash and very short on the curve just because of all that volatility with the Fed and their actions in 2023. But there's a lot of money that we're hoping coming comes back in, and we think it's a great time to do that. If you look at taxable equivalent yields, mm -hmm. you can see that munis are actually out yielding treasuries as well as investment grade corporates. And so we think that's a great time to get in. That's shrunken a little bit over the last six to eight weeks as the market rallied, but it still shows that there's a great position to get in. Spreads are still wider than they were in the sell off of 2022. So there's still room for tightening. Uh, so we really think it's a great time to get in. We have low default rates and generally strong credit quality, especially when you compare it against IG corporates. Can you dig into that credit quality comment a little bit, Jennifer? Certainly there is some concern about revenues at state and, at state and local governments generally decelerating a little bit amid economic weakness and inflation deceleration. What are you seeing that gives you confirmation that that credit quality is still pretty sound? Sure. So well, it's about to be budget season. It really kicks off next week with Governor Newsom from California uh, releasing his fiscal year 25 budget uh, plan. And we've already seen a number of $68 billion used to describe the deficit that the state is facing. It's a little bit of a complicated uh, math number that goes to get there, but essentially it's a reflection of three years worth of budget deficits, and it really gives an indication to the state on what it has to deal with. This is, just as you outlined, it's a result of the fact that inflation has come down. So those, you know, growth in sales taxes from prices increasing and wages increasing, driving up income taxes, that's slowed. Now, the good news for California, as well as municipal credit in general, is we're seeing really strong balance sheets, strong reserve levels, and a lot of budget tools that legislators and governors can pull out in order to address these deficits, whether it's spending cuts, the decision to issue debt as opposed to paying cash for capital expenditures. Uh, they could defer or cut spending. They have a lot of tools. If you're going to be faced with this sort of environment, the balance sheet position of many credits in the municipal market is exactly what you want to weather that. Can you talk to us a little bit about sector specific trends that you're seeing? I know you mentioned in some of your notes about the healthcare space, mass transit as an area of potential risk. What are the sector implications in Muniland? Sure, we'll start with mass transit since you raised it. So mass transit has, A, the implications from inflation around the costs of doing business, particularly on the labor side. But because of other things like changes to where we work, the demand for ridership of these systems is just not what it was before COVID. And quite frankly, we don't think it's going to get back there. So for these very capital intensive um, organizations, they have to come up with a new way to balance their budgets. And the way we see it being solved is really through partnership with the cities and the states in which these mass transit systems reside. And we've seen some of that. We saw several state budgets last year actually grant significant additional money or taxing abilities to mass transit in order to help them right size their budgets. It's gonna take some more work, but we're keeping our eye on that. Um, and then healthcare as well. Healthcare has really been impacted by the negative aspects of inflation, uh, the costs of just about everything going up, as well as the fact it was really hard to find nursing help during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic. Obviously, a very important sector as we navigated that crisis. 
And it resulted in hospitals having to go out and get agency or contract nursing, which is very expensive. So we've seen some good news coming out with a lot of those contract nurses being turned into traditional employment, yeah. um, which helps uh, reduce costs a little bit. And so hopefully that shows that there's some, some, some goodness to come in the healthcare sector. What about, I mean, let's just kind of transition from that to uh, the commercial real estate sector. And I know there are some linkages there. Obviously, much of the focus is certainly on the office market itself, but we know this is a much broader universe here. Do you think that there is a little bit more of an all clear for investors to re-embrace this space in a way that maybe they shunned over the last uh, year or so? Sure. We actually published a paper on this exact topic a, a couple months ago. And through our research, it actually highlighted a couple of um, really important outcomes of uh, where we think this could go. So first, uh, most municipal governments, whether you're a city or a county or a school district, have very diverse revenue streams and diverse tax bases. So to the extent you see buildings turn over at significantly lower prices through sales, um, which um, lessens the assessed valuation. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's going to impact things, but because of that diversity, we actually don't think the impact on city and county and school district financials is going to be that severe. And there's time. The yeah. time is on our side when it comes to renewal of leases and the tax assessment process for mayors and county boards and governors to get together and try to revitalize neighborhoods, revitalize downturn, downtowns, come up with new ideas to um, rebuild assessed valuation. All right, Jennifer, uh, going to have to leave it there. Always great to talk to you. Jennifer Johnson there, Director of Municipal Bond Research over at Franklin Templeton here for our Muni Moment. All right, coming up here, we're going to have a focus on small cap stocks. Of course, they had a huge run up, particularly uh, since uh, the end of October, outpacing much of the broader market here. That's waned a little bit over the last couple of days. What's the outlook, though, for 2024? That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg. Large cap stocks ended 2023 overbought, but intact. But before the broader equity market establishes a strong bull trend, small caps need to stabilize and break higher. Let's discuss now with Michael Casper. He's an equity strategist for us at Bloomberg Intelligence. And we've been talking so much about the phenomenal run we saw in small caps, at least as measured by the Russell 2000 over, uh, uh, what was it, kind of October, November, December here, outpacing the rest of the market here. What drove that? And do you think that is going to continue in 2024? A lot of that was rate reversal hopes. And it really depends on if the Fed follows through with what everybody's expecting them to do. It seems to be for, for about six cuts starting in March right now. So uh, obviously rates have a strong correlation to the multiple that small caps can command. And therefore, if they cut rates, it's an inverse correlation. If they cut rates, multiples can be supported at a much higher level. So we really need to see the Fed follow through with some of the promises that, or at least the market thinks that they're making. How much Fed follow through do you think you need? Can you get just a little bit of Fed cuts and, and small caps survive 2024? Or is it really going to take the full six that the market is anticipating? I think even a little bit could help. Right now, we have a fair value model. It's a lot of uh, kind of distress is priced in to the fair value model. And even a, a, a slight cut could boost multiples quite a bit. Um, our base case is, is for pretty much nothing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the multiple supported at a much higher level than it is at today. A lot of the fear, particularly last year when we saw kind of these fits and starts with uh, small caps trying to sort of get a bid, was this idea that a lot of those companies were either unprofitable or, or at least weren't growing at a rate that was going to satisfy some of the valuations that I think people wanted here. Does that matter in, in that space? Is that critical right now or is there something else you can look to to find some modicum of value? Yeah, so the unprofitable story is pretty much unchanged. There's still about 40 percent of small caps that are unprofitable right now. Um, I don't think that's as much of a headwind as it's made out to be, because that's obviously a trailing metric that we're looking at. Uh, in fact, some of the unprofitable stocks are the rally the hardest off some of these, you know, bear market bottoms. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not as much concerned with how many unprofitable companies there are in the Russell 2000 as much as, you know, what's the Fed going to do and yeah. can, can small caps provide some growth in 2024? 
Mike, you talk to investors all day long. Can you tell us a little bit about what you think their perception is? What are they going to be, what's going to be required for them to get back in the market? What's really holding them back beyond the Fed and what we talked about really driving this space over the last couple of months? Is there something else that they're really looking for to trigger that optimism? Yeah, a lot of it is revenue growth. And, and even three months ago, revenue growth for small cap stocks was expected to outpace the S&P 500's revenue growth pace. Right now, it's back in line with the S&P 500, which obviously is due to a lot of, of bad revisions to 2024 revenues. So we really need to see those revenues stabilize and start to pick up. Maybe Q4 is the start of that. It's quite a low bar for, for a 4Q23. Uh, so maybe a beat can start to kind of move things in the right direction on revenues. Well, what about some of the individual sectors in that space? I mean, we know we, there was a strong bid that came into a lot of those small cap healthcare names, as well as into, of course, energy stocks as well. But what about the rest? What about like all those retail names that everybody seemed to shun? Yeah, I think financials is actually one of the more interesting oh, yeah. ones right now, yeah. uh, especially given all the Fed rate talk. And that one's actually at the top of our, our sector scorecard that we run, okay. uh, along with discretionary, as you mentioned. Um, but healthcare is also a very key component of the Russell 2000. It's about 15% based on GICs, uh, and it's been a dog just since 2021, pretty much. So we kind of need to see some stabilization in that behemoth for uh, small caps to pick up steam, and we, we got that since October. Um, the good news is that with the reversal that we've had at least so far to start the year, it's been more in tech names that ran up a lot in 2023 than in the financials and healthcare names that have been winning since uh, October. Mike, can you talk to us a little bit about the IPO market and how that may be also holding back risk tolerance? I mean, we talk all the time about macro, and but certainly macro can't be the only story impacting small caps, which are now in one of their longest bear markets in U.S. history. It feels like there may be some issuance issues within small caps. Yeah, so I always tell clients that um, IPOs are, are one of the ways that you get into the Russell 2000, really. So if you think about it, you can either fall out of the S&P 500, graduate up from the micro cap index, or IPO as a small cap. And some of the data that we've seen, at least through Q3, I'm actually working on a note for next week, is that 2023 has been one of the weakest years on record for IPOs. And that's really a symbol of how bad risk tolerance has been. It's even worse than 2008 and 2009, mm -hmm. at least through Q3 when I had the data updated. So, um, you know, we'd really like to see IPOs pick up a little bit in 2024. Maybe, again, you know, some of the, the Fed, you know, having a more stable monetary policy uh, can kind of goose that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we really kind of want to see uh, IPOs stabilize in 2024 to to spur some of that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are, are, are hoping for that. Uh, certainly <laughs> a lot of folks whose bonuses depend on it. Uh, Michael, uh, great stuff, great conversation with Michael Casper, uh, equity strategist over at, at Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, alongside Gina Martin Adams, uh, equity strategist for us here uh, at Bloomberg Intelligence. She's sticking with me for the rest of the hour. Where we're going to get some more insight on of those fin minutes that we got earlier today and a good outlook for the U.S. economy. Uh, Greg Dacco going to be joining us, chief economist over at EY. That's coming up after the break. This is Bloomberg. Second day of trading of 2024 and a repeat of what we saw on the first day, and that was losses, significant losses to the downside for pretty much all of the major indices on the day. The S&P 500 closed lower by about eight tenths of a percent. The Nasdaq down about a percent, but it was really the Russell 2000, the S&P 400 mid caps. A lot of those small and cyclical type of stocks really took it on the chin today here. Now, maybe some of that was just profit taking as a lot of folks sort of uh, assess some of the gains that they had made in 2023 and now reposition and rotate for 2024. It's going to be a while before we get another big catalyst. Remember, we still have to get a jobs report at the end of this week. The next Fed meeting isn't to the end of the month. And in between that, we're going to get some earnings. So are there going to be a lot of catalysts for the market that could bat stocks around, whether that goes to the upside or the downside? remains to be seen. We did get a little bit of a hint maybe as to where things might go out of the Fed minutes that we got at about 2 p.m. Washington time earlier today. What did we learn? Well, Fed policymakers did agree last month that it would be appropriate to maintain higher interest rates for some time, while acknowledging they are probably at the peak rate and would begin cutting in 2024. Of course, the big question is, by how much? Enda Curran joining us right now from our Washington, D.C. Bureau to talk a little bit more about what we learned out of those minutes. And Enda, I mean, the good news is it seems clear that the Fed thinks peak rates are here. What was a little bit less clear to me was whether they really saw any material decrease in those rates in 2024. 
Yeah, they didn't really delve into the detail on when those rate cuts might come, Remain, like you mentioned. I mean, there was something for both camps in the minutes today. On the one hand, the Fed made it clear that rates are going to stay in restrictive territory for some time. That's jargon for saying rates are going to be high for some time more to come. But on the other hand, they acknowledged, like you said, that officials are talking about rate cuts now and those rate cuts could come by the end of 24. Now, interestingly, there was some nuance in these minutes. They said that rates will remain restricted for some time to come. But of course, that does not mean they won't be cutting rates even even while rates are so-called restrictive or slowing down the economy. The, the two aren't mutually exclusive. So, so like I said, a little bit of uh, something for the hawks in this. The Fed not signaling uh, any immediate rush to cut rates, but also, though, at the same time, clearly making the point that they will be easing policy by the end of the year. Have you seen an, uh, and, uh, any alterations in the futures markets or the bond market or the expectations of Fed policy as a result of the meeting minutes today? There was some fluttering in the markets, but I think, Gina, the big picture remains, uh, it, this remains a data-driven story. We have jobs coming out on Friday, which will be very important. The Fed minutes themselves made a nod to the point that the labour market is softening. And of course, we'll get, an indic we'll get a read on how, how that softening went in December when it comes this Friday. And then, of course, like Romain mentioned earlier, the Fed meeting isn't until the end of this month. We're going to have several data points, including the jobs numbers. We'll have important earning statements from companies. There will be several indicators in the real economy that will all feed into what the Fed is thinking. And if you look through the minutes today, they make the point that businesses on the ground, small business for a uh, for example, are feeling the pain from these high rates now. So, you know, we didn't have specifics from these minutes today, but when that rate cut might come, there's no real concrete guidance beyond they're saying inflation is slowing down. But nonetheless, it does feel like we are at a turning point now. We're moving, certainly moving past rate hikes. It's a question now of when we will start to move towards that, that moment when policymakers feel confident enough to start easing interest rates. All right, uh, Enda Curran, who helps uh, lead our economic and monetary policy coverage out of our Washington Bureau here. A look back at those minutes from uh, that mid-December Fed meeting. As we look ahead to the next meeting at the end of this month, the big decision on January 31st, not so much just in terms of rates, but about communication, what the Fed wants to communicate to the market. Gregory Daco joining us right now. He's the chief economist over at EY. And Greg, I am curious about the messaging coming out of the Fed. Uh, the dot plot itself on that December 13th day took a lot of people by surprise, even if the commentary itself out of Jay Powell wasn't necessarily as bullish. But the market has interpreted this as this is the soft landing we've been waiting for, and this is the soft landing that we're going to get. Has the Fed, is the Fed still in control of this message? Well, I think that's still pretty much an open question. Uh, I think there's no doubt that the Fed will be proceeding with rate cuts. Um, the hard part for Fed Chair Powell was really uh, announcing this pivot, that the Fed will be cutting rates over the course of 2024. I think the Fed should be very careful in the current environment not to backtrack on this message, because coming down from elevated rates where we are in a restrictive monetary policy stance is not going to be easy. It will require determination and make sure that there isn't hesitation. We're seeing right now a big disconnect between what the Fed is saying it will do and what markets are anticipating the Fed will do. Mm -hmm. We're somewhere in the middle, expecting about 100 basis points of rate cuts from the Fed over the course of this year. But we have to remember that the Fed's determination to get inflation back down to 2% is unwavering, and the Fed will act accordingly, very mechanically, to good prints on the inflation fronts. Well, I mean, at least based on the core PCE that we had just flashed on the screen, the Fed's own targets put it at 2.4% by the end of this year, so still shy of where they want it to be. I guess the question, though, then becomes, there is a balance between continuing to move, try to move inflation lower, and also what effects it has on the economy by communicating that peak rates are already here and that one way or another, most likely, the next move is going to be lower. Does that aid the economy in some way that the Fed needs to be concerned about? I think it certainly does. I mean, we have seen that the labor market has been the key driver of economic activity. We've seen that over the course of 2023, labor market resilience was the key element that maintained consumer spending activity quite resilient and prevented the feared slowdown. The key question as we navigate into 2024 is whether we will continue to see that labor market resilience. And of course, an easing of monetary policy and a lowering, gradual lowering of interest rates by the Fed will help accommodate that soft landing. 
we've achieved largely that soft landing. Inflation has come down. The economy is not in a recession. The key question is whether the runway over the course of 2024 is going to be long enough to sustain that soft landing without creating the bumpiness that we fear in terms of economic activity. I think there's also an important dichotomy here between how sensitive the deal market is going to be to this announcement and this uh, likely environment where interest rates are lower versus how sensitive private sector spending, private sector business investment is going to be. I think the former is going to be much more sensitive to that, the latter a little bit less sensitive to that. Gregory, I'd love to get your thoughts on something you said, dig a little, dig a little deeper on something you said a bit earlier, and that was that there's this remarkable divergence between what the market is pricing or what the market is anticipating from the Fed and what the Fed is suggesting they are likely to do over the course of this year. Can you talk to us about why you think that divergence exists? What is it that the market may be looking at that, that the Fed is not? What is the market focusing on so much that the Fed is not? And how might that divergence close over the course of the year? Well, I think there is that implicit sentiment on the markets front that once the Fed starts cutting, it will cut very aggressively and very early. Um, I think we have to remember that the Fed is very much data dependent, data driven, um, and that it has been surprised by positive inflation developments. But we know that the road to disinflation is not going to be smooth. There is going to be bumpiness along the way. Even though we're still going to be moving in the right direction, it's not likely to be the case that every single monthly print is moving in the right direction. So that will likely keep the Fed and most Fed policymakers on edge and a little bit more careful than what markets are currently pricing, which is essentially starting rate cuts in March and cutting at every single meeting through the end of the year. There are likely to be a little bit of a delay in the start of the cutting cycle, and then the Fed is going to be cautious not to overly cut monetary policy and, and interest rates and essentially risk having to backtrack if there is some negative surprise on the inflation front coming from geopolitical developments, pushing up or putting upward pressure on oil prices or stickiness on the wage growth front or on the real estate front. There are a number of potential risks to inflation. Those risks were noted in the minutes and I think Fed officials will be very careful not to overly loosen monetary policy and risk having to backtrack. And can you talk to us a little bit about the general sensitivity of the economy to interest rates? Certainly one of the conundrums of this cycle has been the relative lack of sensitivity of the business cycle to interest rates, at least so far. And yet we've all been kind of anticipating the long and variable lags will ultimately have an impact on broader economic conditions. But as yet, at least in the employment markets, that doesn't seem to be the case. Are we facing a different economy today than we have in the past couple of cycles? Is the interest rate sensitivity of the economy significantly different? And if so, why? I think to a large degree, we've seen less interest rate sensitivity than in prior business cycles. But we have to remember that the most interest rate sensitive sector remains the housing sector. That reacted very sharply to the rapid tightening of monetary policy. So it's not as if there isn't any reaction uh, from the economy to this tightening of monetary policy. But we know that the sensitivity has been less pronounced on the upside. That should lead us to be very careful in this assumption that the economy would suddenly be much more sensitive to e an easing of monetary policy. I think, again, there's no doubt that the deal-making market is going to be much more sensitive to an easing of monetary policy. But business investment, consumer spending, those are still going to factor the fact that interest rates remain yeah. elevated for the time being. I'm curious on the consumer spending side here, though, Gregory. I mean, uh, there, there's been a lot of concerns about just how healthy households really are. We've seen some of those savings dwindle. We've seen credit card balances go up. And we should just point out nothing right now, at least on a ratio level, is anywhere near uh, the crisis levels that we saw uh, during the global financial crisis here. But they are elevated. And I'm wondering, when does that become a concern about economic growth as a whole materially slowing down? Yeah, I mean, 2024 is going to be this battle between, on the one hand, the robustness and resilience of the labor market, and on the other, cost fatigue in this environment where credit has become an increasing area of focus. We're going to have to focus a lot of attention on whether labor market and income growth remain sustained, or whether we start to see a pullback in employment growth, and therefore an income and people's capacity to spend. 
because yes, household balance sheets are very important in guiding how people spend. The key factor driving consumer spending is not credit, it's income. That's the sustainable form of um, support for consumer spending. So that's really going to have to be the key area of focus. Of course, cracks in the credit foundation of household balance sheets is going to be something that we need to pay attention to. But the key factor is going to be how strong the labor market is through 2024. If we don't see a retrenchment, then we won't see in the labor market, then we won't see a recession, and that will be the soft landing achieved through the rest of the year. Gregory, where do you see inflation finally stabilizing? What is the longer term pace of inflation for the next three to five years? And that's a great question. Um, I think we're likely to overshoot on the downside. I don't think there's any reason to believe that we will land magically on that 2% uh, inflation target. There might be some overshoot on the downside, but I think after that, there are some indications that inflation may be structurally a little bit higher. You have an aging population spending more, you have more supply constraints in the post-COVID era, you have an environment in which you're spending more on climate change and on new technologies, yeah. which generally lead to a bit of a higher inflation environment. All right, Greg. Always great to talk to you. Gregory Daco there. He's Always a, chief, a pleasure. He's a chief economist over at EY. A closer look here at the trajectory of Fed rates. And when we come back after the break, we're going to continue on this line of conversation with a closer look at all things inflation. Catherine Ann Edwards is going to be joining us after the break. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. Let's talk about inflation. There's an official definition out there, and that official definition of inflation is the change in average consumer prices over a period, a number that has in recent months been easing down closer towards that Fed's 2% target. But for a lot of Americans out there, that word describes the struggle to make ends meet. And for a lot of folks out there, that struggle is real. Catherine Ann Edwards is joining us right now. She's an independent labor economist, policy consultant, and a contributor for us here at Bloomberg Opinion. Catherine, let's start off with that. I know it's always kind of hard to sort of quantify or, or sort of provide empirical evidence to show some of the pain that households are feeling now. But what evidence have you found to suggest that there is a disconnect between maybe some of those headline inflation numbers and what real people are actually experiencing on the ground? You know, it's really come through my conversations with kind of typical Americans through various forms of social media, talking to journalists and really feeling the pushback that we see expressed in things like consumer sentiment being lower than what kind of the strength of the economy would predict. You know, inflation has not really had that much attention in our economy over the past several decades, but this recent fight over the past couple of years has really had the word enter our cultural lexicon as a way to express that things are hard to afford. And I think both the presence in the media and talking about it, the experience that Americans have kind of combined with this notion of how hard it is to afford things you know, changes the way that people think of their economic experience and they're able to take one word to describe it. That's not to say that it's a new phenomenon, the way that our spike in inflation as measured as the change in prices over a period of time is, but as a way to put a name to a longstanding problem in that sense it is kind of new. That's interesting, Catherine. Can you talk a little bit about how the housing market plays into this? Because in your notes it seems to imply that the consumer perception is that the fact that house, housing is so difficult to get into, so expensive to get into, so unaffordable, is in and of itself a definition of inflation. Yeah, I mean, y'all, this is pretty simple. It's the basic necessities of food and shelter. Can you afford, you know, the same food and, you know, the same shopping cart that you did three years ago? And, and can you afford a place to live? The past three years have seen food prices increase 25%. The past three years have seen housing shelter costs increase 21%. Over half of people who rent are now housing burdened and that they spend more than 30% of their total income on housing. That also applies now to a record high number of homeowners who spend over 30% of their income on housing. You know, to say that, you know, like, I want to celebrate that we are beating back inflation and that we are not necessarily going to have a recession. But to tell people who are spending 
40% of their income on shelter and spending 25% more on food that we've won something, mm -hmm. that, that has to be at odds with their experience. Uh, it certainly is, and we've certainly seen at least some politicians try to address this. I think probably worried for their own jobs uh, come November, uh, the November election. But it raises a question as to what can actually be done about that. I mean, Jay Powell will basically make an argument that there's only so many levers you can pull, and those levers uh, or the impact of those levers are relatively narrow. Uh, a lot of this is a job for other policymakers, I meaning the legislative policymakers and rule makers to do. And I'm just not clear as exactly how they address this, at least in a quick way. I mean, in some ways, inflation, as it is technically defined, has a relatively straightforward problem and solution. That is, you know, a lot of it is under Powell, Powell's control. We measure it every month. We can raise interest rates. We can see if it's making the, you know, making the adjustments that we want. We had really two shocks, both to supply chains and cons consumption patterns coming out of the pandemic. Both of those are easing. So it's it's a relatively straight line from A to B to C. We saw the problem. We we see it in real time. We we pass our solution and we and we watch it unfold. You know, the people's inflation, as I, you know, called it in the opinion piece, in the way that people experience it, I mean, you're, you're talking about systemic weaknesses in our economy, you know, market failures that have been present for decades, if not longer. You know, there's no way to fix something that quickly, but there is a way to at least make movement on it to show people that you recognize that it's a problem. Because I think the risk of declaring victory over inflation, when for a lot of people inflation persists because they still have problems affording things, that's basically telling someone, you know, you don't matter and you're being left behind. The economy is good. If you are not good, that's because you're not important to it. And so, you know, I think action can't maybe achieve something in terms of these broader market failures and a really rapid turnaround, but making some type of motion to tell people that we are trying and we do see this as a problem. I mean, there, you know, you can't solve things with a snap, but it's worth noting that these markets have deep failures and that they require deep solutions. So any type of movement, I mean, I, I said in the article, you know, Maybe just raise the minimum wage. Maybe maybe just acknowledge that child labor is a huge problem. We should do something about it. Maybe maybe moving forward in all these issues, respecting workers, not getting enough income, some type of signal that, you know, shows that people's inflation is seen. What do you anticipate are the market implications of this people's inflation? I mean, would you go so far as to say that ultimately, if we do continue to see decelerating inflation, certainly that's helped uh, equity markets and, and risk tolerance at large. Is that just not enough? Does it ultimately sort of crumble in an environment where the people's inflation is still so pervasive? What are the market implications here? You know, it's not clear to me because being able to put a name to the struggle to make ends meet is new, but the struggle to make ends meet is not. You know, we've had statistics coming out of the Fed for almost a decade now, you know, what share of households could, make an un could meet an unexpected $400 expense without going into debt. You know, and even if that number reaches a high to say it's 65% of Americans, right, that's still 35 that can't, even when the economy is doing well. So I don't know if it necessarily has market implications because markets have been able to do very well when many people are not. But I think the difference here is that it's kind of galvanized the sentiment of being left behind and of not being able to make ends meet into a, like a very clear kind of focused point. All right, Catherine, uh, really sobering conversation, but always illuminating to talk to you. Catherine Ann Edwards, she's an independent labor economist and policy consultant. Her latest column uh, on the Bloomberg Terminal focuses on the people's inflation and how it's still a big problem. All right, coming up here on the program, we're going to set you up for what markets will have their eye on over the next 24 hours. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, here's what markets are going to have their eye on over the next 24 hours. And we start in Europe with inflation data coming out of France. 
and Germany. Of course, both countries have been dealing with a lot, Gina. Mm -hmm. But then when we come back here to the U.S., we're going to get that drumbeat to that Friday job support, Challenger uh, data, ADP data, and jobless claims. And Challenger is one of my favorite indicators. you got to dig a little bit in the terminal to get it, but look at that level and see if it's continuing to decelerate from a peak made earlier we'll this year. We'll have full coverage with team surveillance in the morning for all of those data points. We're also going to get global PMIs, particularly, I should say, U.S. PMIs. Yeah, for yeah. services sector, which yeah. is a bit of a lagging indicator, mm -hmm. not as important in manufacturing, but nonetheless, you want to see that services number. And I don't stabilize. know if you know this, but apparently it's still earnings uh, yeah. season, which yeah. I just learned about five minutes ago. Walgreens and ConAgra. You scheduled. cannot escape earnings. <laughs> it's scheduled constant. to report earnings. We're going to have full coverage for us. Please join us. Gina Martin Adams, she's going to be back with us tomorrow as well. But stick around. Balance of Power is up next right here on Bloomberg.